today I will be uh, showing how you can um, process diffusion MRI data uh, in Python and using uh, DiPy. So first of all, uh, I'm Rafael. So I'm currently doing a, a postdoc at the Champagne Limon Center of, of the Unknown. I previously have uh, was in uh, in Cambridge doing my my PhD. So and now I'm I'm working on the has a postdoc on the Shemesh lab. So here is just a picture of the the, the Champagne Limon Center of the Unknown. So it's located look look in the historical part of of Lisbon. And it faces the, the Tago River, or in Portuguese, the Tejo uh, River. So it's a very uh, nice uh, place in terms of envir in environments to, uh, to work with very nice uh, views. So currently, I'm, at the moment, I'm doing, uh, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm doing um, uh, still methods development, so science, uh, science and methods development. And my, my main objective is to try to understand with all the different diffusion MRI techniques, which are their uh, advantages and pitfalls, and what is the, their importance on, on different um, uh, uh, studies. So for example, aging, development, uh, uh, disease, has cancer, and um, or stroke. Uh, so as part-time, I have been also collaborating it with, with, with DiPy. And what is DiPy? So DiPy is a free and open source software and to basically process uh, uh, microstructural information, uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, anatomy in Python. Uh, it focuses mainly on diffusion MRI analysis, but it also has some generic uh, um, pre-processing techniques that I will also uh, introduce. And so the, the main idea of, 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 of DiPy is not to be an open source development of uh, uh, one institution. It's basically the share of knowledge of different methods of developers. And so it has contribu uh, several contributors from across different labs, different countries, and different uh, um, uh, yeah, institutes. And the main idea is to, so this started as sharing the, our expertise, so having uh, other experts on diffusion in MRI to 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 look into our code, if uh, and doing suggestions how to improve our tools, and ultimately we also want to provide uh, some useful tools uh, uh, for for people. So this is just like an example of some of the countries that already contributed uh, uh, to DiPy. I'm not sure if this is completely updated. This was taken for a workshop to already a year ago. But at the moment, we have around 100 contributors. And this is uh, more or less from 13 universities and uh, institutions. OK, so before I continue, I, let's, I want to show you the DiPy web, uh, web page. So if you go to DiPy.org, you see here. Um, the details of, for example, the, the installations that is also in my repository. And here you can, for example, see the different tutorials. So these are a bit different of the ones that I'm showing during this. And if you're interested in, uh, in knowing more, you can also, uh, there's a uh, button here that says workshop. And annually, we always organize uh, a one week workshop where you can, uh, well, it will be an extended version of the, of the, of the workshop I'm, I'm doing in these two days. Yeah, so what DiPy uh, covers? So if you go, we have several different uh, things from reconstruction, from different methods to, to estimate microstructure properties from, from diffusion MRI data, from tractography, there's, we are, uh, there's also strong work on uh, registration that includes track resist registration. That is something I think you need from this, from, from this package. And then there's also preprocessing, visualization, uh, et cetera. So if you go to my repository, this is more or less the topics that I will explore in these two days. So the first day I will be basically focused on the tractography part. And tomorrow 
how to use advanced uh, models to estimate uh, micro, micro uh, structure. So regarding type I installation, so what I recommend to use to, to, to install uh, the DiPy uh, or other dependencies that that you need from DiPy is to use Anaconda. So after you uh, install Anaconda, you can open the the Anaconda uh, navigator, and then from there you can just right click on this arrow here and open a, a terminal. In this terminal, you just need to type conda install c conda fork DiPy. And this will install uh, DivePy depend, uh, dependencies and the latest release of, uh, of type. Then you also need to install uh, Furry. So you can do it using pip. And if it doesn't work, you can basically use the same command lines, but instead of DivePy, just write Furry. So this was the, an issue that we were observing. And yes, you're, you're ready um, to go. Okay, so let me give a look at how people are doing in Slido. Anyone with still difficulties of installing? See the chat. So it seems that everything is, is working fine. So let's continue. Okay, so if you go to, in the chat, you have a link to, to, the, to the repository. So if you press it. So here I uploaded the tutorials that we are talking uh, 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 today, so they are under the page notebook, and we are basically we will explore the six first tutorials on on on, on cryptography. And so, you, what you can do is basically you can just uh, copy this or download that has a zip. Are you showing? My, are you seeing my screen? Just a double check. So you can just download them. So I, I will put them in my desktop. And then if you have an account, you press here the, and then if you go to the folder where you, you have, I'm just going to the, I'm going to the folder where I downloaded the tutorials. And now to look to the, to the tutorials, you can just open uh, Jupyter. So if you do Jupyter notebook, so in the browser, it will open your, your folder and if you go to to the notebooks you can open the first tutorial so the material that i'm presenting it's all done on the on 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 jupyter uh, and so what is jupyter notebook so basically it's a document where you can uh, edit code uh, so for instance, and also uh, documentation it contains different uh, shells. So for example, this shell is represented by a markdown uh, shell. And so it indicates that what you put inside of this shell, it's just, it will be just displaying the text. And then you can also have um, cells of code. So for example, in this case, I'm importing, so I already have this successfully installed, so this will just import. Uh, uh, and so for example, if you want to add a shell, you can just insert sellable before, and then you can define as, so for example, if you want to do your own comments, you can ins ins insert a cell and do your own comment. To run each shell, you have to press shift, -er, shift enter. So anyone with issues on installing, let me double check. So we have 14 attendees that already installed a DiPy, which is great. So before going to the tutorials, why we care about diffusion MRI? So MRI, as we, we saw in the in previous, so how as we see in the previous uh, in the previous day's workshop, so MRI allows the imaging of structure and function of entire tissues. However, sometimes the information that we are interested in are in the, on the lower resolution. So for example, uh, if we have phenomena like tissue uh, maturation, this changes happen uh, in, inside of the, the voxel. So sometimes there's no morphological or, or, or even functional changes and you have changes on a microscopic scale. Uh, also this includes uh, issues uh, phenomena has uh, tissue degener uh, degeneration, 
which includes accidental loss and demyelination, and also our for example, if you want to characterize uh, different pathologies, that's though in structural MRI, they will have similar contrasts. But if you look to the histology, they, they, are, they are different. So diffusion MRI, what it tries to bring is this information into our, our, our images. And this is based on the properties of, of diffusion. So what is diffusion? Diffusion is a mechanism of, of, of transport uh, that happens in, in liquids and uh, in gases. So even if everything is in equilibrium, equilibrium if we target some water molecules uh, inside of a glass of water, let's say, we, we, we see that due to uh, thermal uh, energy of these particles, this will start uh, uh, colliding and and diffusing. This is known as the, the Brownian uh, motion. In the case of the free water, this uh, random motion of molecules will, will be equal in, in, in different directions. So this is known as isotropic uh, diffusion. In free water, is also diffusion is also characterized to be Gaussian. And what this, this means is, for example, if we target the, the placement that each uh, mo uh, molecule uh, did and do a graph, this will, will follow um, a Gaussian distribution. And this Gaussian dis distribution will, be high, will be have a higher variance if you, you measure this in, in, the, in different uh, time. So this is basically the mean uh, dis displacement squared it's related to the, the diffusion in time. So which says that the displacement will be higher with higher uh, times. And also if you have medias that are, that this thermal collisions is faster. For example, if you compare uh, gases with li liquids, this will have a, a higher diffusion uh, coefficient. So this process will happen much, much uh, faster. Uh, typically it's also interested to define the Characteristic length has a square root of the the mean uh, displacements uh, squared, and this gives more or less the information of um, how molecules uh, are. What is the dimensions that mo uh, molecules are moving on the, a given experiment? So, if we assume this free water, we know that in in the uh, human body at 37 degrees is around. Uh, three micrometers squares, squares. In, in our uh, MRI acquisitions, we may probe diffusion under 10 milliseconds. So you see that the characteristic uh, length is on the orders of my, uh, microns. So this is why diffusion is sensitive to the, the, the microstructure um, uh, property. So this is only the case of free water in, and they have a uh, whole message here is they have these two properties that they're isotropic and Gaussian. However, in biological tissues, diffusion propagates in a different uh, way because we have structures, we have microstructures. So for example, if we look to a region of well-aligned fibers, and this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of white, uh, white matter uh, fibers, and we look now to the, to the displacement of water uh, molecules, you will see that this no longer are free to move on uh, on different directions equally, and this is known to be uh, uh, say this is typically referred to an isotropic. Uh, uh, so if you see the due to the the barriers of the microstructural co components, you will have um, you will have less displacement on the directions perpendicular to the fibers and uh, a higher displacement uh, along the, 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 the fibers. It's also no, the diffusion in biological tissues is also known as non-Gaussian. And what this means is if we propagate the displacement or the probability of a displacement of all of uh, the molecules of a given direction, this will deviate from the Gaussian uh, distribution because you no, no longer have only a, free, uh, a single free system, but you have several uh, compartments. And, and for example, in confined compartments, 
you could not uh, have molecules that are 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 propagating on this tail. So you will have uh, diffusion more uh, bounded. Um, and then if you look to par parallel directions, you will see that this, uh, since the restrictions are less, this will uh, uh, will approach uh, nearly to the to the Gaussian uh, uh, distribution. So how we measure diffu uh, diffusion in the in MRI? So in MRI, typically what you have is a set of gradients that encodes the spatial information of uh, MRI uh, acquisitions. So with diffusion MRI, what we do is we add a, a additional pair of gradients, which will be sensitive to this, the, this, this motions. So for example, if we apply a gradient directions on the direction shown here, and for a, a given uh, gradient uh, uh, weight, we, we see that we will have extra uh, decay uh, that will depend basically on this equation. So this equation, what, what, what it says, that is the signal now decays with a B uh, uh, factor, which is basically uh, a value that gives the weighting of diffusion uh, MRI. It, doesn't, it only depends on the, the acquisition parameters of your additional pulse uh, gradient, and it will, also decay, uh, decay more if you have higher diffusivities. So higher diffusivities are known to uh, appear along the, the axons. So for example, if you're targeting this direction, you will see that you will have a higher signal decay uh, on this, this, this direction. So to explore the, the format, so to first explore how, what is diffusion MRI data and how it's, it's, it's saved, we, I will give you some minutes to to, to give a look to the, the first uh, uh, tutorial. I stopped sharing. So I will give you some minutes to look to the first uh, tutorial. So it's a tutorial ZRZ1, load and explore diffusion MRI data. And then after this tutorial, there will be a, 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 a small exercise. But so I will give you some minutes in the same, in the same time, I will, I will give some assistance of people that are still struggling with the, the, the installations. Okay. So let's say that I will give 30 minutes. In the meantime, I will give assistance to people that are still struggling to install the iPi or open the, the, um, the notebooks. So I just saw you want to comment. I will give a look to Slido. Okay, so there's some questions on how to open the the Jupyter Commons. Okay, so I will. So the workshop materials are on the um, on my GitHub repository, which link was shared on the, the 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 chat, and I can share it again. So this is the first thing. So can uh, you you guys give me a thumbs up if you already found at least the material where the you download the material from my repository. So I will do the opposite question. So is anyone, just give me a sec, let's go away. So anyone still struggling getting the, the notebooks, downloading from my repository? Okay, everyone got it. So now I will show how to open the, the, the notebooks. Um, so after, so in the Anaconda Navigator, you will here see your environments. So basically, if you are installing this for the first time, you will just have your base uh, environment. In this case, uh, I have a new environment, which is DiPi release, because I install this in the, I, I normally work in the, in the developer re uh, release. So I just, I created an independent env uh, um, environment for this workshop. However, if you install it by your base, you will, you will see that you will have this arrow on your base the right button here, and then you can open a terminal here. So then you go to the folder of your notebooks, so to move folders CD. In my case, it's on my drive, desktop, and then the f I save this folder on my desktop. So I save it here, my prime dive by mine, go to the terminal, and then it's Jupyter Notebook. And this will open the, the folder on your browser. And then you, here you have the different folders. 
of this workshop and the notebooks are on, on their notebooks. So what we have to do first, it's tutorial 001. And just open it. Is anyone having problems on downloading the data? I saw this question here, but I think I, I cannot see it anymore. Uh, Afonso is, is asking if he has to uh, run all inputs. So the way to run, so for, for you to run this, the, the tutorials, you, ha you have to run all the, the cells with code. If you skip some of the cells, well, it will depend on what you're importing on the previous cell, so it will not run. So you really have to, yeah. to run one by one. Any question not about the, um, the, the code, but about diffusion MRI, I'm also uh, use this opportunity uh, because I have been working with diffusion MRI uh, methods of development for already 10 years. So if you have questions about some of the basics of diffusion, or uh, please, please feel free and use this opportunity also to, 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 to make these this questions about the theory, let's say. Okay, so I have here a question of what is the B value? So B value, basically, when you uh, introduce a diffusion encoding, or for example, you have a structural image, and then you introduce the additional pair of uh, uh, to to quantify the additional uh, gradients, diffusion gradients to target the the diffusion along a direction in the uh, in an intensity. So the the B value will be it's the weighting of your exper experiment. So it only depends on your acquisition parameters. So so I I will show you again the slide. So so basically this is the additional diffusion gradient that will be applied on a given direction and in, in intensity. And what is this intensity? So this intensity or weighting will depend on different factors. So the duration of each pulse, the time of this uh, between the two pulses, the diffusion pulses and the gradient. But to, to represent this, all these variables in the single uh, variable, you have this, the B value. So you, if you see, it only depends on the B value. And you see that, for example, if the gradient is higher, the B value will be higher. So this is basically giving the weight of your experiment, the diffusion weighting of your experiment. Was I clear? Okay, so, so there's a question about what is the difference between B value and B vector. So the B value gives the information of the weight and the B vector contains the information of the direction because diffusion is, uh, is measuring on different directions. So the B vector is the direction. So people that are struggling with the exercise, there's also a folder with solutions that you can look to the solutions. And we are also, I will, I will go through the, 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 tu the tutorial and some, and I will give some more two minutes and I will go over the tutorial. And then the people that were, people that were not able to to finish, we can go through it together. And also including the exercise. Okay. One more minute. So everyone at least run the, the tutorial without doing the example. Thumbs up for people who run, but... So I will go through the tutorial now. Okay, so the first tutorial that I, 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 I present is basically how to load data in some of the basic uh, formats on... on on uh, diffusion. Okay, so let me hear. So if you all look to the the share screen, the first thing that you have to do is import DiPy, and then DiPy we will we have the sample data sets uh, which we which we use for our do documentation. So has as I show, if you go to the DiPy uh, page, there's also a session of tutorials where we explain the different uh, functionalities that are already implemented and we use the sample data sets. This is also very useful for uh, workshops, as this one, and also for people that are interested of learning a bit about diffusion, but doesn't have data already uh, acquired, okay? So for downloading data, DIPA already have some tools that will download uh, directly from, from online repositories. So this is the case of the uh, SFIN uh, uh, data sets acquired on the on SF, uh, CFIN uh, Institute, which is uh, an institute on, on Denmark. 
and this data, we'll run it. So when downloading in this case, uh, it was fast because I already had this, this data download on my system. And if you want to see where it's, it is downloaded, you basically can look to the variables that is un, uh, out. So here it will show where the files of the diffusion were. were uh, this will depend on your own compute. So basically, and regarding to the diffusion data, this will have three different files. So it have a nifty file where it will contain the image that you, acqu uh, that you acquired for this data set. And then bvals and bvex will have the information of the bvalis, or in other words, the diffusion weights of this experiment. And the b vectors, which is the direction of each uh, experiment. So to load the data, you basically have to in input on this function. So from dipy io image, you can load uh, nifty uh, diffusion uh, uh, files by putting the director here on this function. And this will uh, input the, your data on the 4, uh, 4D matrix containing the information of the data. So the 4D, why? Because you have uh, voxels of your three-dimensional uh, space, right? Different slices and if, uh, uh, so the coordinates of different slices, uh, X, Y, uh, Z. And then affine. Uh, this affine basically gives how, uh, what is the coordinates of this, so how your field of view was, pl uh, was placed. And then you, the same way you can also read the B values and B, B vectors. Yeah, here is showing that the shape is 4D. And if you want to plot an image, you, you can just use one of uh, a basic um, a package from Python, which is matplotlib. This basically produces figures in a uh, very similar way uh, from MATLAB. So, uh, so people that are used to, to MATLAB um, will easier adapt their 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 fun functions using this this code. So here I'm plotting the middle uh, slice, and for the experiments, one hundred and um, fifty. So regarding to the bvals, so if you see the format here, this each slice will have a ninety six by ninety six uh, voxels, and this data set will have nineteen slices. It was acquired with different, uh, so all the, the volumes were acquired with different B values and B vectors. If you see the shape of your B, B values and B vectors, it comes to this number of experiments. So here I'm just plotting the dimensions of each folder and plotting the parameters of the experiment. This was acquired with the, this experiment was acquired with the B value of 1000. And uh, this is the, the direction that, so one thing that is, one, one thing that is important on, on this tutorial is the, the notion of the gradient table uh, object. So in, in DiPy, uh, as you will see in the, in the next tutorials, we always use this, this, this object. This object basically serves to summarize the acquisition parameters. In this case, you, the, you only have the B values and B vectors, other uh, inf information. Uh, and you can reconstruct this table summarizing experiments by inputting the, the ver variables loaded, bvals and bz. And then this will also do some uh, calculations. So for example, it will indicate which uh, experiments correspond to uh, the b-value equals zero. So this is analogous to not uh, the, the acquisition without having um, a diffusion uh, acquisition. And you will see that it's only true on the first. So the first will correspond to uh, a, a, the B's, uh, a, a B value equals Z. And for example, if I, you can uh, see that, if I insert the cell below my B vals, you will see that the first one corresponds to the zero. Yeah. So the exercise, so the, in the first exercise, I was just asking uh, you to plot some different uh, 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 experiments. So image for different experiments acquired at different B values and B vectors. And so you can just uh, use again the, the, the functions using um, 
uh, the uh, match uh, uh, plot leap. And, and here in this case, I'm doing in different uh, subplots. So, so the first thing is using the git uh, tab B0 mask to select the B0. So the way how I, I did it was, well, you just need to select it uh, using uh, using this 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 command. So, what this this syntax means is that you're selecting all the voxels. So this is the three points, all the voxels from your uh, from the the volume that corresponds to true. So this is analogous if you just specify the dimensions. In this case, I'm also doing a mean. This is basically to adapt, if you want to adapt this code uh, for uh, data that was acquired with more than one B0. So the strategy that I, I, I decided to do was just to average all the data that was acquired by B0. So in this case, this will, this will not do big thing because you only have one. And then base zero and the the data from different the different experiments. So these experiments were selected by I manually selected for different B values and B vectors. So if you see, if you can see uh, the V B values that I'm plotting on this upper row, it's uh, regarding to uh, the B value 1000, and in the lower panels I'm plotting for a higher uh, B value. And you see that the the signal decays are higher as expected by, by the, 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 the attenuation of the signal. So basically this equation that I have at the beginning of exercise uh, two. So the higher the B, va the B value, the more attenuated is the, is the signal. It also depends on the directions. So for example, if you look to the, 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 the this second uh, direction, and this basically corresponds to the, the directions go to right to, to, uh, to left, so this is the x uh, coordinate, and you see that in the regions of the white matter, well, where you expect the fibers are aligned, and where to have the higher, the, 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 you will have lower uh, at, at attenuations. Comparing the upper row to the lower row, you will see that they have exactly the same direction. So this have the same direction that this. It basically contains the same attenuation, but in the higher uh, uh, degree. Okay, so in the exercise two, what I'm asking uh, to do is basically to remove the the information of the of your relaxation. So uh, typically, diffusion uh, MRI acquisitions are built on the T uh, T2 weighted uh, acquisition. Uh, so the image that I'm showing below will also depend on the T2 weighted contrast. So a, a simple way to, to remove it is basically doing the subtraction of your signal with your a, a, S0. So you will only depend on this exponential B in diffusion uh, apparent uh, diffusion. Uh, another way to do it is to compute an apparent diffusion coefficient. And for this is basically playing a bit with this equation and you see that you can the the apparent diffusivity uh, using this 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 and so what i'm asking to do here in this example is to compute the apparent diffusivities for uh, for each uh, experiment so how how i how i did it so basically i just looped i did a for loop over the different experiments to avoid cal calculation in a mass and the uh, regions out of the brain. I'm also, I use this line to just mask the, uh, the computation to, to, to zero. And then I plot, I did exactly the same plots. So this four plots corresponds to this four plots, but now for the apparent diffusion. And what I wanted to show in this notebook is Although you, uh, you, you remove the T2 weighted information, the apparent diffusivities that you will, you will, measure, will measure will differ from experiment by ex to experiment because you have the dependence of the direction that you measure your major diffusion. And also uh, you see that in higher B values, uh, you will have slightly different uh, x. And so if this equation holds, you will not, 
uh, expect that because if the lock uh, signal decays faster with the higher uh, uh, weighting, this could be corrected just by dividing this this the, this this p value. The difference on the estimates of this are to, due to the known Gaussian properties of diffusion, and this will be discussed more carefully to, in tomorrow's uh, uh, tutorials. But just have a, 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 an idea that if you compute the apparent diffusivities for individual directions and the values, you will have different uh, information. And it, this goes um, through the next uh, 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 tutorial. Okay. So as you can see that the information captured on this 4D diffusion data is it's multivariate. Uh, and in, the, in your uh, studies, you want to quantify your diffusion properties uh, in the summarized way. So you, you don't want to have a 4D so summaries of. And so a, a standard way or a conventional way to do this is the diffusion tensor uh, imaging. And it's what I will be introducing. So what is diffusion tensor imaging? So in diffusion tensor imaging, what we do is you represent your data by a 2D uh, uh, second order uh, tensor. And so, for example, if you look to this this fog of my previous example, and you and you expect that diffusion is higher uh, perpendicular to the fiber, so here you have basically uh, the genus of the corpus callosum that is connecting the right and left uh, hemispheres, and you will see that the diffusion will be faster in this in this in this direction, right? So the way to to represent this is. Uh, a strategy to represent this is using this, this tensor. So in this simple voxel, you will see that uh, you will have different diffusivities along the, the uh, parallel and perpendicular direction. And in this case, it will be enough just to, to have uh, three values. So the diffusivities on, along x and y and, uh, and zeta, which is uh, which is perpendicular to this, 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 this. So based on these values, you can then define the axial diffusivity, which is the, the, the diffusion along the, the, the axons, the radial diffusivity, which is basically the average of the two perpendicular directions, and the mean diffusivity, which is the average of everything. So this diffusion tensor basically can be represented by this ellipsoid. So, since I said that we, we need these three values, why we, we need this entire uh, tensor? So this is when the diffusion is not aligned with your coordinate systems. So imagine that you have now uh, a voxel that is a little bit shift and now the, the, the fiber has, uh, has a direction that is not aligned to, to, to Y, let's say. So in this case, you will need to have the fitted diffusivity will will need to have the values on all these uh, six uh, co uh, coordinates, and then how uh, the way that you compute the axial and radial diffusivities is to do the Hagen value decomposition. So if you compare these equations with the geometrical um, uh, representation of the ellipsoid, with this Hagen value decomposition that it, you will do, will basically give the Hagen values, which will correspond the to the to the di directions to the diffusivities along the main of this ellipsoid, and then the yeah the vec the vectors will give you the information of of these three uh, vectors. So in this way, you can see that the the axial diffusivity, so the diffusion along the accents, can be given by the first Hagen value. The radial diffusivity can be computed by the two. Uh, other Hagen values, the average of the two other Hagen values, and the division, mean divisivity has uh, the average of all Hagen values. So based on this, oops, based on this information, you can then create parametric maps based on this the scalar. So for example, here I have the mean divisivity uh, of a, a representative brain. Uh, here is the axial divisivity, where you will see that you expect higher diffusivities on the white uh, on the white matter right and then it's corresponding to the to the to the perpendicular direction so you will 
there's a higher intensity of these values. The radio diffusivity, on the other hand, have the lower uh, values. And you also can compare a fractional anisotropy measurement, which is basically a measurement uh, saying how different are the axial from the radial uh, diffusivities. So this fractional anisotropy uh, represents the anisotropy from zero to one, while zero corresponds to uh, cases of diffusion that are completely equal in all di uh, directions. So the case of diffusion on ventricles, as of free water on the ventricles. And it's near to, to, to one in the region that you have the well-aligned cur currents of fibers. So in this case, on the corpus callosum of the, of the, of the, the white matter. Uh, in previous studies, if you look to the literature, uh, uh, studies using DTI typically use this FA has a measurement of uh, maturation in this degeneration. So for example, this is just a plot that I extract from my PhD thesis that explores the, the changes of FA across uh, age. And you see that you, you, this measurement is sensitive to, to um, anisotropy declines that starts from early uh, uh, 20s. So yeah, so the next tutorial that I want you to, to explore is a tutorial if you go to notebooks, tutorial two. So I will give you, so, so in this tutorial, I'm basically explaining how you can process diffusion tensor imaging uh, using DiPi. And I will give, let me see the schedule that I have here. I will give you 20 minutes to go over this, 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 this tutorial, okay? In the meantime, if you have questions about theory or about code, please let me know. In the in the, the DTI tutorial, I so for the exercise, I already added uh, um, the solution there. But if you want to try to do it by yourself, just add add the cell uh, above and try uh, not to look to the the solution. So it's basically the solution is on cell eighteen. To ignore that, and you do it by yourself. Okay, so we are already on half of the given time. Um, just have a of how people are doing. Did anyone finish in 10 minutes? Thumbs up if I already anyone finished in 10 minutes. So I created a, a, a pool on Slido. So for the ones who finished the, the tutorial or already run but didn't finish yet the exercise, but the, the, the rest is run. Please indicate on the on the pool. So the ones who already com com completed the example, uh, the tutorial, and and everything. So one thing that you can also uh, uh, do if you still want to to explore uh, what I DiPi has more, you can, for example, look to the, to the different DiPi tutorials, or also look to the to the help function, uh, the help. Uh, the documentation of if fun function to explore different uh, the inputs. So this workshop was designed to for for beginners. So I I will start. I'm I'm doing the progress slowly. But if you're in more advanced, uh, please f feel free to 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 look to the to the optional parameters. Uh, also make questions uh, about that, and I will be happy to 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 reply. Uh, another thing, so uh, typically on the um, on the di and the full length workshop that we organize annually on, on in, in DiPi, uh, we even encourage, uh, encourage at, at attendees that already have their own data to also start trying to process their own data. Due to this only being two days, it will be hard to 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 do the, this. But for example, if you want to to do uh, to if you already have some data and you want already to process the DiPi, you can basically use the lo load and read uh, functions that I in introduced in the last. So I will just quickly show that interested in reading uh, data. So. In the last tutorial, I showed you that you can basically use this, this, this function. So in this case, 
these are being retrieved by this this the, this function, this getter. But if you have your own data, you can just create these files. So for example, and if you look to my desktop, I have a data sample here. So which will have the, the nifty uh, diffusion data, the B values uh, file in the B vector. So I can specify into the plots, we hear the paths. So if I go to the tutorial and define my nifty, shaking that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can define it. Oops. Uh, I think I have to name this differently. Oh, now what is going wrong? Hmm, this is strange. I will double, uh, I will let you know after what is, what I'm doing wrong. I'm not understanding what is going on here. But basically you can, the idea is you can define your own paths and load them. Yeah, and the other thing that I wanted to, uh, I will go back to it after seeing. The, the other thing that I wanted to show if, for example, if you use this help fun functions, you can also see, so for example, here I'm, I'm, I'm showing the help of the median Watson. And you can, if you don't know what the function is doing, just type help in the, the, the function and we'll have the description of the that is doing. In the same, for example, for the DTI fit object that was created on this example. So you can see other parametric maps that I'm not exploring here on the, um, on the, on the tutorial. So for example, we have here the mode, to explore this in the same as the, the when you define the DTI tensor model. For example, you have different fields that you can do. So the default is defined as the weighted linear least square, so you don't need to specify it on the code, but you can see here the, the, the inputs. Okay. So let me double check what people are doing. Yeah, about the downloading error. So, um, my suggestion is try, to, for example, to restart restart the the the, the kernel of the um, of the uh, notebook because sometimes there's like conne uh, connection uh, error errors when you try to download or just try to repeat the the command lines and if this is consistent, just try to 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 restart the uh, the notebook and I can show how to do that. For example, if I go to my first uh, tutorial, there's here this kernel and you can restart it. So you press restart and it will start by, by fresh. So let me know if this solves the, the, the issue. Okay, I will, get, I, I will give two minutes more and then I will show the, the, the I will go with you over the tutorial. Okay, <clears throat> so I will show the, the tutorial. Um, I also want to mention that about loading your own data, I will double check what is happening on lunch break, why I'm not able to call, define the, the, the strings. Okay, so, so yeah, so with this tutorial, I'm basically explaining how you can reconstruct a given model, uh, in this case, DTI uh, in, in, in DiPy. So all reconstruction models in DiPy are saved on DiPy recon. So for example, a cell below. So for example, if you type import DiPy tab, you can see all different models that are already implemented. For, for example, we have here uh, the DSI, which is a model that we will explain this afternoon. We have the DKI and DKI Micro, which are ones that we will explain uh, tomorrow, but they all follow the same uh, uh, rule. So import them from reconstruct. And then after you had defined your gradient table, you, you, you fit it given the, ten the, the, the model. Okay, in this case it's a tensor model uh, only. And then after defining the model giving your exp experiments, then you can fit it uh, with the object uh, fit function. Having this fit, you can extract the standard uh, measurements. And uh, here we're only discussing the mean diffusivity, the axial and radial diffusivities in the FA, but there's 
uh, other uh, exhibits that you can extract. For example, as I was showing below, you can have a mode, a mode, okay? Then also the model parameters. So we'll just show the, the size of it. Oh, sorry, shape. I think it's not saved as a NumPy array. So let's do an array. Oh, oops, of course. So uh, this model will just will give 12 elements. So because under the, 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 the core, what it's doing is computing the diffusion tensor and has, you can read from the tutorials, you have uh, six uh, parameters on DTI uh, model, but what it saves is the Hagen value decomposition. So you will have the Hagen values and the Hagen vectors uh, for, from this. So three Hagen values, and then you have nine uh, parameters from the, the Hagen, Hagen vectors. So if you're interested to seeing the, uh, the Hagen values, from here, and you have different values. Yeah, in this case, you only have uh, the last dimensions will correspond to the three uh, Hagen values of each of the, the, the voxel. Mm -hmm. So then I, I, I showed the example how to compute uh, measurements and also introduce how one can plot a color-coded FI. So this color-coded FI, what it gives is the information of FI and also the directionality, the main direction of the diffusion uh, tensor. So red indicating uh, right to left directions. Then you have, uh, so for example, here you have the genium and the splenium, uh, uh, splenium of the corpus callosum that in the mid says is applying, show that you have a predominance on the left, right. Then you, in blue, it's inferior to superior. So for example, here's the, the, uh, the, the spinal tracts that are going up. And in green, you have um, anterior to prestore your direction. Uh, for example, you can see here uh, in this, this region of the, um, um, of the corpus callosum proje uh, proje uh, projection, uh, the, that it has this, this uh, anterior to, to, to prestore directions. And then you can also save uh, your, the, your, your statistics using the save nifty functions. And here uh, I'm showing the code, how to generate the ellipsoids from this zoom uh, uh, slice. And this, what it uses is functions based on, on, on furry. So if you press this, this will open X or window. So I change the, it's just double checking that I'm reading the right data will take time, so I will just interrupt it. Ah, here it is. So yeah, so here's the ellipsoids of that zoom data. So I had, there was a comment that you can only um, zoom, so you can zoom it by scrolling and rotating the, the file. Yeah, this is the only that the this functions uh, allowed. However, uh, because I just want to use a, a simple visualizer of it, but there are um, more tools uh, where you can add more, more uh, uh, features. So interesting. Uh, I will send you a, a, a tutorial, a DIPI tutorial that explains how you can add here uh, different features to this uh, visualization. Will you close it? And yeah, and the, uh, the example, what I'm uh, asking basically to do is just to repeat the on the cropped version of the, the of the data used uh, that you give by the median uh, Watson uh, uh, algorithm, and so since it's a different data set, you have to define the again the gradient table because the experiments now are different from the 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 ones loaded uh, before. Okay, so let me load this, and the idea of the example is to then fit these two versions. So at the moment that you define the gradient table, then you fit the data. You don't need to define it to two times the model because the model is, is for that cropped data in original version has the same acquisition parameters. So you just need to fit it to time. So here I'm fitting a tensor uh, mass, uh, the mask, uh, only the mask and then the cropped data. And then you can extract the parameter maps from, uh, from it. Yeah, and to visualize them, 
you can just use the sub functions, uh, um, the subplot functions of mat matplotlib. Okay. So does anyone have a question about this tutorial? So thumbs up if everything is clear. Okay. So I think everyone. So I will move move on. So in this afternoon we will then explore how to do a uh, tractography. So I will just briefly introduce it. And then in the afternoon, then we can fully merge to, to what we have to do. So what is tractography? So tractography is basically a, recurs a attempt to reconstruct their bundles from your diffusion MRI uh, data. So in the afternoon, we will explore different algorithms that are mainly based on the ter deterministic and probabilistic tractography algorithms. First, we will look to the determinist uh, uh, tractography. And basically, uh, uh, what we need to, to do is have the information of the directions on the single uh, uh, vox. So in this first tutorials, it will be based on the DTI. So for example, in the ellipsoid, we need a strategy to extract the main directions of this ellipsoid. And then after that, what we need to do is basically defining the uh, some starting points where you want to, to define projecting the, uh, the reconstructions uh, of uh, fiber tra trajectories. And then you need to have a criteria of where this will uh, stop. So this can be just stopping when reaching regions out of the brain, or for example, reaching, uh, uh, reaching regions of the gray matter, or, or you can also impose that if you reach uh, an FA value lower uh, with the low anisotropy to, 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 to stop, or for example, if it reaches uh, uh, a voxel which the direction is completely different. So yeah, in the tutorial, I will teach how to do that. And then after defining this, we need algorithms to propagate the, 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 the pathways. So basically what it does is it grabs the directions of each voxel and then it starts following in. And when reaching another voxel, it will update the direction and so on. So in this way, you're able to extract the, the pathways. It's important to note that this is not uh, a real fiber. So each line will not correspond to a, white, uh, a single white matter uh, fiber. It's just like a pathway, uh, a representation that will highly depend on the processing that you, 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 you do and, uh, and the, all the, the inputs that you define on the, on the, the algorithm. Normally, each pathway it's uh, called a streamline. So this is then introducing this. The next tutorial to do is uh, tutorial uh, three. And so I think for the, the the ones, if you don't have any questions, you can already start looking to this uh, tutorial. And uh, there's ten minutes le left for 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 lunch. So if you have uh, any questions about the, the code done on this morning, please let, uh, uh, let me know. And in the afternoon, then we will go through this, this tutorials. If you don't have any questions, you can already start looking to that tutorial. So in chat, I have a question from Alvaro uh, about where, how to define the, the, the seats. So I don't know if you already looked to the the tutorial. I will go into uh, deep on it in the afternoon, but just to show that point, that specific point. So after you run this tutorial, you will this tutorial will have the four steps. We'll have the four steps to to do the tractography. And so uh, the second step is where you define the the the, the C. So in this case, I'm just using. Uh, as you will read the, the, the labels of the, 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 the mid sagittal plane of the corpus callosum. Uh, but you, for example, you can use another mask to define more uh, voxels to, to, to see it. So for example, just the brain mask, or there will be also defined the white matter masks if you want to do a full white matter tractography. And then you can change the densities of the, the, the seed. So for example, this variable density is, is saying that you're uh, seeding each voxel by a uh, two by two by two grid. So you will have 
uh, eight points in total, but you can also have different. So for example, if you just want to have a seed per voxel, you can just put one by one by one, and this will be much faster to uh, to run. And useful if you want to do a entire tra tractography reconstruction, or you can, if you want more seeds, you can increase another, uh, the density. So for example, now this is a three by three by three, um, 27 uh, seeds per, per volt. Yeah, but we will go carefully. We will see this carefully in the end when discussing this tutorial. Please feel free to explore other options, other tools, like for example, uh, here in the tutorials, I'm focusing on the corpus callosum, but if you're already finished and you want to do a, a, a old brain uh, a tractography, you can just do it by seeding instead of labels equal to seeding the, the both white matter labels, so one and two. And that variable is already created uh, in white, uh, what is the name? White matter, yeah, it's a variable called white matter. If you do, if you put that on the seat, you can run the whole brain at tractography. If it's taking too long, you also can define less seats. So instead of using a grid of two by two by two, use a grid of one by one by one, which we basically a single uh, seat per voxel. Yeah. Subo also is, is just trying and it's running slow. Yeah, it's why in the tutorials I was focusing only in the corpus callosum, but then for if in your studies, you want to use tractography and you want to use whole brain reconstructions. These procedures can take overnight to, to, to run depending on the seeding, right? The more that you seed, the, um, well, it's hard to discuss about accuracy of per, in precision because it depends on the, on all the other steps. So the, the directions. But this, uh, some people working on and doing tractography analysis, what they ensure is that at least the seeding reaches a steady state on their analysis. So, uh, for example, if they only seed one seed per voxel and then running more seeds, if they see the results are more or less the, the same. And there were even some, some authors mentioning that you you might need a lot of seeds to reach the steady state, but it also depends on what is your application, uh, what is the application that you want to do. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to show that, uh, the tutorial. Okay. Okay, so in this morning, I was also, before I started the tutorial, I was showing how to load the, the data and I was having a problem. So basically this was because, yeah, this is, the first time that I'm doing this in a, a Windows computer. And what I noticed is uh, in the string definition, it was not recognizing the, the, the slash. So how to overcome this was basically the, uh, doing a double slash. So if I do this, then it pr prints uh, exactly what you want. And uh, so this is, I'm loading a data that was on my desktop. So in the folder called data example, and you see that it can now read it properly. You can also use, use your own data to, to, to run the tutorials. And this is the objective, right? You want to use these tools on your data. Okay, so deterministic tractography. So as I explained, this consists in, uh, in let's say, so here we are uh, defining the, local directions based on the diffusion temp. So before you load the data, and one thing to mention on the data, this data, you, could, you can also download the labels. So it's basically a file that will create numbers uh, on where the re uh, on which regions uh, that you are. So for example, the two is the, the, the white matter of the mid sagittal plane. And one um, is the other voxels of the of the of the white. Um, yeah, so this was uh, labels that some someone created. Uh, uh, so if, for example, if you on your data set you want to only seed um, the mid sagittal of the corpus callosum, uh, one thing that you can do is just uh, manual define with with other with tools a mask. Of the um, of the of this corpus callosum mid sagittal uh, uh, plane, 
Uh, if you're not interested on that and just doing a full uh, tractography, you can just use a brain mask. So the way that you, you get the direction, so basically you have to define the, the model as we did in the pre previous example, the DTA model. And then when you have the model defined, you can extract the peaks directly um, using this peaks from model function. Uh, this uh, requires some extra, uh, for example, default sphere, a relative peak threshold. For, for the context of DTI, this is not, uh, it will successfully find the, the maximum uh, direction since we only have one main direction. But I will explain this inputs on other uh, reconstruction models that can have several peaks. And then I ask you just to plot the, the direction fields. So I will, I will do it for the, the ones that are struggling with visualization. So here is for a splice, the directions. And you can see that, for example, in the genome of the corpus callosum, you see the directions going to right, left uh, direction or, on, or uh, left, right. We don't have directionality in diffusion. Uh, yeah, and then the color coding is the same color coding that was used on the color FA. So red is pointing the left, right, and then you have in green the anterior posterior direction, and in blue the ones that are pointing up to this to this plane. Right? So if I rotate it, okay. So this was just for visualization purpose. Then uh, for the seat uh, uh, mask. So here I'm just using the labels too. But for example, how was, as I was saying, if you want to do the entire white matter, since the white matter was defined here up, is it here white matter? You can just put, put here the white matter if you want to do the full white matter and changing the density. It's if you want a one seed per voxel, you can do like this, but I will maintain so we have consistent. So defining the stopping uh, criteria. Here, what I'm doing, I'm using AFA threshold. So if the values are lower than 0, uh, 0 0.2, uh, I'm assuming that you're already out of white, white matter because uh, uh, white matter is the, the values that is the regions where you expect to have high uh, FA values uh, in general. Well, we will see then later that this has some limitations. Let's assume that. And then for pr propagating, you just need the local tracking and use the inputs, the stopping criteria, the, the, the seed, and the directions. The fine is basically to, to, to tell you about how, uh, what is the coordinate systems of your field of view. So for example, if you have a tilted field of view, this will be taken into account here. And then you just generate the, the streamlines. So this has to be, um, done in, uh, in, you define this streamline generation, some uh, uh, maths before doing actually the streamlines. So this makes the, this is, was designed like this to make the code runs faster. And then you can run the streamlines using this, this. So then I can, and here you have the reconstruct of the corpus callosum. And you see that it's connecting the two to uh, any sphere. And then you can save them in the TRK format. And this is if you want to, to, to load this uh, using other software or if you want to reload it on, on, on DiPi. And so for example, to show that, actually we'll, yeah. To show that there are some interesting tools in DiPi. So even this morning we're asking about how other options to visualize. So in DiPi, after you install it and you can open a terminal, there's a visualization called DiPi Horizon. So, uh, so, okay, so I will open it. Okay, this is taking a while because I think I'm loading it. I run it the, um, this tutorial with the whole brain's uh, uh, seeding. So I'm in the local copy that I created. And I think it's why it's taking a time to, to load. But it's just, so in the meantime, I will open another terminal to just load the ones that I, I, I saved. So this is on, uh, I have the tutorials saved and um, it already loaded. So this is the, yeah, indeed. I was using the full um, tractography reconstructed. So here you see the two hemispheres 
and the full uh, segment uh, segmentation. So, but let me go to the, let me open the one that uh, I I was working now. So just double check which is a local copy. So I have it on brand API directories. Or, sorry, then I noticed that I had so many this extra. Okay. Exactly. So yeah, it's here. So dot pi horizon. And let's load the what I produced here. Okay, so it's exactly what I I produced on this example. Rotate it. And then this this is a very cool tool uh, because you can also uh, overlay uh, your parametric maps. So for example, if I now give extra input FA created on the last tutorial, you will have the tractography together with the, the image. And then you can use this the sliders to have a notion which are the voxels that were, were. And now one thing that's unfortunately, I will not show uh, the details of how it works, but DiPy it's very, it has very uh, strong tools on clustering. So if you want to do that, you can use the input of, and it will cluster, will do a, a track, a streamline based plus extra steps. So here's the clusters. And then there's this, these tools where you can uh, threshold the, the, the lengths of the cluster. So uh, clusters that have smaller lengths will disappear. Here it is. And if you want to see what the cluster is grouping, you can select a tract and press E, like expand centroids. And you can see exactly what are the, the streamlines that are present. So this is very nice tools, I, th I think. And even you can, if you press H, it will hide all the tracks that you're not interested, just the one that you selected. If I expand it, and if I want to reverse all this, I press R. So it will go as it was before. So this is very, some useful tools that you might find useful. Okay, so saying this, the next tutorial that we, were talk we will talk about is the probabilistic uh, tractography from uh, DTI. So just what this, the, what this means. So basically in the, in the, 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 the previous ex example, this, you were following one direction uh, per, per voxel. And this can be uh, very limited. So for example, if you have some misestimates of the directions, perhaps a better way to do uh, tractography is using a probabilistic. So in each time that you, you, you propagate your, 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 your code, the, the direction will be sampled uh, with uh, um, a distribution function, a probability distribution. And typically use the orientation distribution function, which is called, it's defined by, with the propagator. So what is the propagator? The propagator is basically the probability of this. So it's basically what I showed previous is having this probability functions, but instead this case, I'm using 1D probability, but the propagator is a full 3D uh, probability. So having this high geometry, the, the, the probability of the, uh, having a direction is defined by, okay? So just to have, to not be scared about the maths, but if you want to have just a visual interpretation of this for the diffusion tensor, the ODF it can be computed directly from it, and it will give like a single direction, and you then, instead of grabbing the, 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 the probability of this, you can, this will be sampled. So instead of using the maximum direction, each time that you will evaluate this voxel, it will generate a probability, a direction probability. So this is what I have on the next tutorial. So it's tutorial, uh, tutorial four, DTI probabilistic tractography. And I will give you some minutes to, 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 to run it. Let's say, in the meantime, if you want, if you have questions, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, so for this example, we use exactly the same data as the previous one. 
Uh, so here is summarized uh, the code needed on, on this first uh, uh, shell. And for example, you define the white matter uh, mask uh, has the, the two uh, labels that were imported. And you also have the data, the bivalves and the bivacts, which were saved in the gradient table. Then uh, using the dipi segment mask, we mask the data. Uh, has from previous, we also have to define here the DTA model, but now here, the main uh, difference is instead of previously that we use the peak from models, fungi, here we have to, we use a probabilistic direction gitter from DiPy direction, where you input the, the tensor ODFs, okay? And this are, can be called from the data, uh, DTI fit ODF. You might also uh, uh, wondering wh what is this sphere? So this sphere basically is a set of uh, directions sampled over the space with higher density than the directions that you use for, for, for your acquisition. And this is basically to sample the ODF with a higher uh, uh, angular resolution that uh, than your uh, your your date. So you can also plot the ODFs. Okay, here they are. So now you can see that it's not uh, we are plotting the ODFs. Before we were in the previous example, we we observed the peaks, and you can see that in some regions, for example, here in this this region, you have uh, uh, a more uh, uh, probability that approaches like a more uh, isotropic object. So uh, here, the, the sampling the directions will have a higher uh, direction sampling uh, degree. And here, this can be explained by the presence of of crossing bundles on this on this on this region. So, oops, okay. So the other two steps are exactly the the same to define the seeds and the stopping uh, criteria. So here we are, is, use exactly the same. A criteria that we use on the previous example. And then to propagate the streamlines, we also use the local tracking as a previous example. And we generate the then the, the, the streamlines using the streamline function. I already run this. So that's okay. So here is the output that we give. So remember before we we had a much uh, smooth uh, reconstruction. And this is due to the deterministic the nature that we had before. Now, uh, since directions are estimated uh, probabilistically, you can see that you have here some, some of the paths. You have this wiggling, which is basically the nature of the probabilistic direction sample. So the, the advantage of some of the advantages of this, this algorithm is you see that it can while previously you were only uh, resolving uh, streamlines that were connecting the, the both uh, superior regions of the both hemispheres, now you have some lateral projects as well. Of course, then the streamlines also appears to be more noisy and you have uh, more uh, um, false positives present on, on, the, on the data. Any questions? Thumbs up if everything is, is clear till now. Okay. I think I have the majority of. Okay, so in the next tutorials, what I, I will be explaining is uh, other me uh, metrics that that are able to estimate uh, better the directions uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, fibers that are crossing using a high angle resolution. But before that, I, I want to, to introduce some of the limitations of, uh, of, the, of, of DTI. So I will start my, my screen share again. So here uh, I will show some code that is not present on the tutorials, but I, I, so my, the interest is not for you to know all the details of the, the, of the code because this will not, we will not have time to cover this in the today work, uh, uh, workshop, uh, but I I will share this this code with you uh, after today's meeting. I will upload this on my GitHub under the name of simulations. Uh, so basically, what I'm uh, I'm doing here is I will use uh, simulations to show some of the limitations 
of, of DT, uh, DTI. Um, so these simulations were taken from, from, from DATA and we use the simulations normally it's to test our, our implementation. So all the, the code that we have in DiPy needs to be heavily uh, tested. So we, so that we know that we are not breaking anything when we are producing, for example, new tools and that things are properly impl implemented. And each time that we submit new code, these tests have to, have to run uh, to ensure that we didn't break anything from, from, from previous uh, tools. Uh, here in this tutorial, I'm using this test just to, to, to show some synthetic uh, uh, voxels. So for, for, for this, the first thing that we have to do is to simulate a set of acquisition parameters. So what I'm, uh, what I'm doing here is in DiPy, we have uh, some functions uh, to create um, uniform sampled uh, uh, spheres so that we can... Uh, uh, simulate acquisition of different un uh, uniform sample directions. So this is using the disperse charge uh, code. So here the code, I'm just generating some uh, random sample directions, and then I will use a disperse charge to ensure that they are even sampling over the space. So here I'm just showing this. You see here in red is the, the random uh, generation, and in blue is the final uh, outputs and you see that in blue it's uh, more evenly spa spaced over the, the sphere than, for example, the initial uh, estimates that had a higher per, uh, concentration of points here in this, this. So then you have to generate the gradient table object as you do for your fitting. Uh, and what I'm showing here is a simulation of a single diffusion tensor. So let's assume that we have a ground truth diffusion tensor that have an axial diffusivity of 1.7 and a radial diffusivity of 0 0.3, okay? And I will be generating. This is plotting the, the FA that is, is, is giving on the simulation. And here I'm showing the illustration of this closed by mistake. So yeah, so this is the, the tensor that it generates from that simulation. And it's, it's a voxel corresponding to so then to generate signals from that tensor, we can we have uh, uh, numerical sim, uh, simulations from that by seems voxel and you can generate the signals. This runs. And now I'm doing the, the fitting as I do uh, with the standard uh, loaded data, but now I'm putting the synthetic signals and I'm plotting the ground truth tensors. And you see that it's exactly what we we, we simulated. So it's, it's the same tensor that I showed before. So for a single uh, diffusion tensor, DTI is able to, to represent well. However, let's, yeah, and here before that, this is just ODF. So now just let's uh, consider a case that instead of having one uh, Gaussian uh, tensor, we have two. So this can be representing uh, a crossing a fiber bundle in a very simplistic way. So this is the ground truth geometries that you have two populations. And then if you generate this signal, so in this case, I'm using a multi-tensor uh, function to generate this, okay, we'll close it, and fit the diffusion tensor. We see that the given diffusion tensor, it doesn't give the direction on, if, on any of the, that's ground tr to ground truth. And we also can see that the FA given it's much lower than any of the two uh, And even if you reconstruct ODF from this tensor, you will never, you're not able to sort the, the, the two uh, directions of this ground truth permit, uh, ground truth system. I will just pl plot again the ground truth system. So it, is, it's, it was giving a direction like in between here and with a very uh, low FA. So to uh, overcome this, this, this issue, issue, several techniques have been proposed to uh, has attempt to resolve the information of, of crossing fibers. And this is what I have next. So as I said, uh, DTI fails to, to resolve the direction of crossing fibers. However, this information is present on the propagator. So for example, if you track the displacement over time of water molecules, you will see that this will correspond to the directions of crossing. Uh, 
Um, so ways uh, to overcome the DTI problem is, for example, using a diffusion spectre. And what this technique basically does is that this, uh, it first assumes that in your acquisition, your additional diffusion uh, gradient pulses have a duration that it's much smaller than your your uh, the, the the two pulses. Okay, the time between the two pulses. And if you assume that, it was mathematically showed that the propagator is basically the uh, uh, the relation between the propagator and its signal can be given by this. So this is basically a Fourier transform. So if you acquire your signal for different B values and uh, B vectors, computes the, 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 in the inverse of Fourier transform and you will have the propagator. Okay, so here there's the notion of the key value. So what is a key value? So key value is basically another representation of the B values and the, the, the direction of the, the B vectors. So yeah, so here is a transformation of a key value from the B value. So you just need to, 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 to convert it. So what this basically gives in space is the following. So you just sample several directions with, se with several gradients because a key vector is, is given by the magnitude and the direction. And then you can apply the Fourier uh, transform to have the propagator. And then with the propagator, the ODF can be computed by the, the a more general ODF can be computed by the equation that I show uh, uh, below. Okay, so the limitation of, of this is this requires a big sampling of the key space. Uh, and so this, uh, is, it, this is very uh, unpractical because it's, it, it requires long acquisition times. And also it acquires uh, diffusion uh, weights or B values that are typically not accessible in the cl clinical scanner. And I will show that in the, in the bit. So there have been other strategies to, to try to reconstruct the ODF in a more simple way. And one of the strategies is the key ball imaging. So what it does is instead of trying to fill the entire space, it focuses on the single direction. And so it's, it's why it's called a key ball because you're basically measuring the, the you're extracting uh, measurements from uh, key vectors that are distributed on the sphere, okay? And then you can extrapolate the other for information by doing some assumptions. So for example, in the key ball, you assume that along a, a, a direction, the dif a diffusion is Gaussian. And from that, you can re reconstruct the uh, an o o ODF. So there's other techniques. Uh, so for example, if you one can see that this ODF is quite uh, smooth. And the reason because uh, of that is because we are not actually measuring the direction of, of, of fibers. What we're trying to measure is the, the, the probability of a maximum diffusion direction. And the diffusion process is quite smooth. So even if you have discrete uh, fiber populations crossing, you will never have like a discrete uh, ODF. So try to overcome this is people have introduced the constraints spherical convolution. And basically what, it, what this says is that you can represent your signal while by an ODF, the fiber ODF. So it's basically the, the, the sharpet uh, geometry indicating the directions of uh, individual fiber populations. So here, this will be the ODF for this system that have ascending and this uh, right to left uh, uh, tracks. And so if you know the expected signal of each of this, this of each individual fibers, you can represent the entire signal by it's the... Another way to see co uh, constraints spherical to convolution is the same for the ODF. So for example, if you have this ODF and you know it's a uh, uh, ground truth fiber ODF, you know that each one will have this response, this smooth response, you can do uh, the, the convolution of this. So you extracted this, you want to know this, so you just want to have to con the convolute this with this and get an estimate of the fiber ODF. So this is, for example, if we apply it to this ODF and we have something that is most, much more sharp. Of course, that we are not able to get 
uh, a completely um, dis uh, discrete uh, uh, shape due to uh, numerical and com uh, computing. Per, uh, per, per. So basically, here the the idea is now we can use do uh, tractography using this uh, ODFs. So and it's what we were showing in the following uh, tutorials. So we can exactly do the both probabilistic and uh, deterministic uh, tracking. But instead of falling, for example, in the deterministic direction generator, instead of getting the peaks from the maximum of the, the, the ellipse, ellipsoid, we, we can get the maxims of this uh, ODFs. For the case of the probabilistic directions, we can directly input this, this geometry and this will sample directions in each run with a higher probability of being on the lobes. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, track talk. So for getting more into more details on the deterministic direction uh, uh, generation, uh, we have to take into account other uh, uh, parameters. So uh, first is the uh, a sphere that have the directions to evaluate where to find the maximum directions. So for example, if I, if we evaluate based on this grid, we can find the, 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 this both higher directions. Uh, and in this case, since this is a noise-free simulation, it will, be, uh, it will be enough. However, in real data, you have contamination of uh, 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 noise, and which could generate suspicious uh, lobes. So a way to, to try to exclude these uh, lobes is to define some peak thresholds. So for example, the, uh, the relative peak threshold on the tutorial that you will, the, the will see will exclude thresh, the peaks that are lower than a given threshold. So this will perhaps be enough to remove uh, this small peak here. And if this is not enough for this case here, we also have the mean separation angle. So it's basically give an angle that uh, you can have two uh, directions. So if you see this direction here, we'll have, a, uh, we'll have a small deviation from the direction defined here. And so when this happens, what the code will use is uh, select the one with higher uh, intensity. In this way, you can uh, exclude this, the, the superior speaks. So in the next tutorial, what I will ask to do is to, to look for the deterministic, is to look to the, the uh, hardy deterministic uh, tractography. So if you go to DiPy main page, it's open. so there's several ways that you can get help if something is not. Working. So if you go below, is it, you have here a button that says shut, if press here, it will indicate that uh, a mailing list where you can submit an email. Um, so if you have something that is complicated to ex explain in the in in the in the small uh, uh, chat, you can create the email and su uh, submit this mailing uh, list, and it should indicate on the beginning of your your email on your the, the subject that is related to DiPy and send it with the details of what is happening, like, for example, an image of, uh, of the errors that you're giving, and people will be, happy, will be quick on, on replying. If, there are some, if you have small questions that you want to, to post to the developers, there's also this uh, opportunity to, to, to do uh, quick chats. So if you go to that page, you set setting. Well, you need to, to log in. Wait, there's uh, another way. So since I'm already a login, if I open here the chat, so you need to log in with a, a GitHub account or, or, or an option that it, or a GitLab account. And people, uh, if you have very short questions that you want to know, like, oh, uh, I want to do this in my data. There are some tools are available that I can do that specific task. In that IPA, is there any tutorial produced for that? Uh, you can just type here, and people tend to be very fast in replying. So if you see, there's a, there was, yeah, even yesterday, people were. 
alternative. So imagine that you, you, you find a bug on the, on the code. There's also, and you want to report to the community. Another way to, to do it is you go to here, this button where it just say fork, and it will go to the Git uh, lab where the source code's often, and you can create an issue. You press here and you can create a new issue, posting your, your, your so for example, in the case of Lisa that had problems on, on, on the visualization of uh, furry, um, I think the best way since it can have a error message or just also showing that it's, it freezes. Well, in this case, since now it's working, but it's only freezing, perhaps you can just drop on the chat. And one thing, uh, di uh, questions related to furry can be done uh, on DiPy because furry is kind of something that was born from, from DiPy. So uh, uh, developers, what they realized when they were creating visualization for DiPy is that it's uh, having uh, visualization and methods were constructed in the same package will, will, was, was being very complicated to, to maintain. So it's kind of a, a children of the DiPy project furry that basically concern have all the, the visualization dependencies on of, uh, of, and DiPy in some sense, it's uh, it, the reconstructed by itself is independent. It's on, only when you need to, or you want to visualize uh, your data is then you call the furry dependent. Yeah. So for example, in my research that I don't use structography, I, I never face or I never deal with uh, furry issues. Okay, so saying that, Let's run the tutorial, the the determinist uh, hardy uh, tutorial, and I will give twenty minutes starting from now. Okay, so there there are some uh, errors on the ODF uh, plotting. So, uh, Geoff, uh, am I saying your name properly? Well, he is pointing that uh, he is having some. Uh, issues on plotting the ODFs of the constraint spherical the convolution uh, model. And this basically can be just uh, the, that the ODFs plotted for the sys your system it's, uh, are too, too, too much. So uh, if you want to visualize the ODFs, a recommendation is just use a zoom version or a, a zoom version of the data. So as I did from the DTI uh, tutorial, uh, when I uh, when it was plotted the 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 diffusion. Uh, but for the purpose of the tractography, you don't need exactly that cell. So that cell it's only for plotting. So if you're not concerned of seeing them now and you want to proceed, I think you can just do the next cells and everything will uh, will run, run uh, properly. Only if this is the first time that you define the, you importing the, the windows uh, from the DiPy visualizer. But in this case, you can just use that command lines uh, 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 below when you plot. So basically for plotting the truck topic. So please, uh, let me know if this uh, results in your case. And if you can proceed with the, the tutorial, even not showing, uh, looking to the to the ODFs. Uh, if you have any difficulty, uh, I can further help. Okay, so I will, I will repeat. Um, so what I was saying is, this error might happen because for your system, uh, it might be too heavy to load the, the ODFs. So if you want to see the ODFs of your data, Perhaps you can just try to zoom the uh, do a version zoom version of your data so that it's not that uh, heavy anymore. Uh, but keep in mind that this cell you don't exactly need to run the tractography. So this is the cell is completely independent to the rest of the code. Uh, proceed and uh, running the other cells. I think you're still able to to run tractography. Please let me know if it's not. So I have a question from da uh, Daniel, who is asking what um, determines the color of each streamline. So uh, the defaults of what you're outputting is basically the, the average direction of the, of the streamline. 
So that is the, the reason why on the corpus callosum uh, examples that we, we are running, the, the track seems to be uh, uh, mainly red because basically it's averaging the, the directions of the tracks. And if you average, even if it's going up, down, in average, it's going left, right. So it's, you, if you connect the end and the starting point, you will see that this, uh, the, the, the mainstream end will go left, right, or right, left direction. And that will determine the, the color of the, of the streamline. So if you already run the tutorial, just respond to the, to the latest pool that I created in Slido. In the meantime, I will get the cough. So did anyone finish already? Okay, so we are ha I'm having a lot of yes. So I think I will go now through it. And then after that, I will introduce the final uh, challenge. Okay, we'll start sharing. So if you, if you after reading this, this tutorial, you can note, note that is very, uh, the structure is identical to the DTI um, deterministic tractography. So it, it's, if you see, it's basically copy and pasting the, 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 the same or similar code. The main uh, uh, difference is, is more on the direction uh, uh, gitter. So in, the so in the first shells, basically what I'm doing, I'm just loading the data. And then to fit the constraints uh, spherical to convolution, one of the difference uh, uh, on this model is that you have to input a response function. So it's basically what I was showing in the slides. You will have, you need to have this response function to, to, to the convolute the, the, the ODFs. So here we are uh, fitting it uh, from, from a, a region of interest on the center of the brain. So this to, to do that. There's other strategies. If you're interested in more uh, advanced strategies, you can follow the, the full uh, DIPI tutorial uh, on this example here that I'm linking. Uh, these are strategies that can have a response function in an iterative way, but I'm not, I didn't suggest to put this here in this tutorial because it is quite uh, uh, computing demanding. Uh, then, after uh, fitting the response function, you can just plot it to double check that everything is fine. And you can, you, uh, you can then, uh, you have to input it on the constraint spherical deconvolution uh, uh, cl class objects for the definition of the uh, uh, constraint spherical convolution model. And then after having that, has a standard uh, that has done in the, in the DTI model, you have the, you can get the, the, the directions. And this is using exactly the, the same function. So the, the peaks from model fund. And now it's important to define the relative peak threshold because now you will have several peaks, not only one in the main separation angle. So how's I explained it on the, on the slides. So some people were, have, were struggling to plot the, the, the ODF. So I will plot them here. So for one who are interested to, to seeing them. So my, um, so my tutorials are running the visualization and starting to get uh, uh, slow because I have several things open. When this starts happening, I typically just close everything that I, I, I have and I restart if I zoom. So here are the ODFs. And you can see that, for example, in regions that you expect to have crossing, now you're able to resolve of fibers. So you see that there's uh, corpus callosum uh, projecting on these directions. And then you have some bundles growing uh, anterior posterior. So yeah, then after defining your peaks, you exactly do the same steps that you did on the, on the DTI deterministic model. So basically you define your seats, your uh, 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 stopping criteria. In this case, I'm not using uh, FA. So in the DTI example, I was using FA. In this, I'm, in this example, I'm using a general version of the FA that computes the anisotropy of the ODF. So not the diffusion tensor, so the anisotropy of the hanging values of the diffusion tensor, but the full anisotropy 
the variance of the 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 ODF ac across different directions. So it's basically what this comes. And this, so you see that, for example, in the crossing regions, if you compare the general FA with the FA, uh, it's you still have a lower values on the crossing uh, uh, region, but the the difference of the contrast of well aligned to crossing uh, regions, it's uh, it's not that 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 uh, big. So you can it's more easy to adjust the thresholds using this this maps, but it's still not ideal. The ideal. So if you are interested in knowing measurements that doesn't depend on the crossing fi uh, fibers, this will be discussed in to, uh, tomorrow's tutorial. Okay. So then after having the stopping criteria, uh, uh, criteria, then you can just use exactly the same local tracking function and produce the, the, the streamlines. So let me plot them here quickly. So if you can see that, although this is a deterministic uh, algorithm, now this reconstruction is able in some degree to resolve the, um, the the lateral projections of the corpus callosum. There's some even some there's still some limitations here, where you still you also expect to have here some lateral project be, because of this is uh, basically due to the to the 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 the, the, the large fraction of extend, extending tracks from the cortical spinal tract. So it's very hard to resolve crossing fibers on this on this on these regions. So it's a general limitation of, of, uh, of the uh, tract uh, So to overcome this, we can try to do uh, uh, the deterministic uh, tra tracking using uh, Hardy. And for this, we have the last, uh, let's not tutorial, but exercise. So, so in the last tutorial, what you have is basically, um, I have basically a skeleton of the code that you should uh, be doing for reconstructing a probabilistic Hardy uh, algorithm. So here I'm ask uh, there's uh, I'm asking you to do this based on the ODFs extracted by the CSA model ODF using the probabilistic uh, uh, direction uh, uh, Gitter and using the same seeds and stopping criteria of the of the previous uh, uh, tutorial and uh, what the this the challenge here is to try by yourself reconstruct uh, probabilistic tractography using uh, hardy based on the 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 code that that uh, i have been um, uh, i introduced today uh, if you're struggling uh, too much. Uh, there's the solutions here, so you can find a version of what you can. But I will suggest you to try to do it by yourself, um, and come yeah, and compare the the results. Any questions, or even if you want some suggestions uh, before giving uh, looking to the solution, just let me know, and I can give some tip. Can you send me some comments about how things are going? Still struggling. Yeah, so Joff is saying that he is, he finds the exercise quite hard. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we can do is to try to 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 look to it um, together. Or anyone? Okay. So I was just setting here the the things to show you, and I will start sharing. Okay. So here is the the exercise empty. So, and I, I'm also comparing here the solutions. And before uh, uh, showing the code, uh, I think I will show the output. So here's the, the output that we get from this exercise. So we can resolve much better the lateral projections and including on the uh, uh, posterior parts as well. But of course, has this is a, a, a probabilistic uh, algorithm uh, generator, you will this the streamlines will not be 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 smooth, and this can generate uh, uh, a large amount of uh, suspicious uh, streamlines that doesn't reflect any 
uh, to, uh, through a white matter bundle on the uh, on the uh, on on the on the brain. But yeah, each technique has their limitation and advantage. So regarding to the exer exercise, so getting directions from the the the, uh, the uh, MRI SM, uh, CFM model. So I will show here the code that I use. So in this case, so in the previous tutorial, we were using the constraint uh, constraints of the convolutions for the directions. And we were also using this model for defining the general uh, um, FA. Uh, here, I, uh, in the, the probabilistic uh, example, I suggest only using this one because this gives a, a, a more smooth uh, pr probability uh, distribution. So this gives more possibility uh, of generating uh, directions on uh, uh, out or a bit out of the, the main peak direction. So for example, if you use a constraint sharing code, um, you will always generate peaks near to the maximums because it's quite sharp. Right, so the way to do this is now you use again the probabilistic directions gitter, which is exactly the same that you had from the DTI. Right, you see here, it's exactly the same. But instead of now using the tensor ODFs, what you use is the keyball um, uh, CSA um, uh, model. So yeah, so to, to reconstruct it is here. So this has been introduced on the previous tutorial and then you get the probabilistic gitter and you extract the ODF and has on the D, uh, DTI example of the ODF, you have, uh, you run the probabilistic direction uh, uh, gitter. Okay, so defining the seeds, you could just, uh, use what we use on the, the last example. This is exactly the, the, the lines of codes that you, you find in previous examples, for example, here, right? And then for propagating this, this, the streamlines, again, you, you have to call, well, sorry, first, the stopping criteria, the stopping criteria, since we already produced this uh, CSI uh, 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 fit for, for the directions. Right, you, we don't need to define it again, so we just need to input its general uh, FA. So th the, the last part that was missing to, to explain is how to propagate the streamlines. And you can use, again, the same look. And by giving instead, so this normally the input of this, this, the, of this function, so let me run this. This will fail because we will only import this and help local. So yeah, so here basically it's the, the, the inputs and it basically uh, uh, requires a direction gitter. In this direction gitter can be the discrete uh, directions as we uh, produce on the determinist the uh, um, tutorials or it can be an ODF. And the code will uh, figure it out uh, by itself what type of direction gitter that you, you input it. So it's exactly the same lines of code that was produced on the, 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 the last tutorials. So you just need to, to run it and you will have uh, the tractography um, uh, done. So one might uh, ask, so if you see, this is the, on, on my solution, in eight shells, you have the full uh, code. Of course, that you're, if you're a user and you're not interested or you want to use something that is already uh, implemented, you can just use the this code once on a single script. So for example, if you're not used to the notebooks and instead you want to use a uh, spider and what is, let me go to Anaconda to open Turbino. So for the ones that are not, that doesn't know this. So spider is an interface that is very similar to, to MATLAB. So if you're, you're familiarized with MATLAB and you can copy, uh, the .py files that will work as a scripts. So you can just, for example, let's create. So this is basically a PyScript. 
And here is a kind of a terminal that you can test. Uh, it's a, it's the Jupiter. It's the same thing as the shells that have in the are inside of the the notebook. So, for example, I can import here DiPy, Pi, and you can do calculation in the fly. But you can also run a, a script. So, for example, I have here a D, the DTI script. In this, no, this is this is a, the source code. Okay. But for example, if I create a new file and I I glue the the lines of command of the notebook here you can just run it by, so you can just define your inputs and run it has a let's say a black box uh, however since structography uh, depends a lot on the reconstruction um, it tends to to know what is happening under the the hood of the um, uh, of today's uh, workshop However, the moment that then you 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 do uh, you did this once, then you can uh, have your own scripts ready and to run in, uh, for example, other subjects and uh, 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 etc. And for example, if you want, if you prefer the spider to work on spider instead of notebooks, so notebooks are very useful uh, when we are teaching uh, tutorials because you can have text of information. In below showing the respective code of what you're expecting. But if you prefer to have the, the uh, work on Spider and have this, the, the scripts, you can also load the tutorials from, from DiPy. So the ones that I designed here are, are different uh, because it it's, was designed to point the aspects that I want to highlight here. But for example, if you want, you go to DiPy and for example, you want to run some example, okay, fiber tracking, uh, introduction to deterministic maxim beta. So this will have the same format of the of the, the no, uh, notebooks. But if you go here, you can also download the source code. Copy here in my. So now, if, if I open that file, it's the same. So people that are familiarized with Map with MATLAB, it's basically this the same as the point M uh, MATLAB files. So I let me open. So I put it in my desktop and tracking deterministic. So here's the code, and you can also run this. Uh, you can also use directly the Py scripts to 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 run, and then use this to process your your own data. Okay. So this is basically the last thing that I wanted to discuss on today's uh, uh, workshop. So tomorrow we will go. We will discuss uh, strategies to 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 quantify um, uh, measurements sensitive to microstructures. So in the similar way as uh, FA, uh, uh, but alternative measurements has uh, from the the FA using microstructure different microstructure model or different signal representation models. So for example, diffusion kurtosis imaging. And that uh, will be the objective of, uh, of, of tomorrow. Today, just a refresher. You can open a, a terminal. Actually, I already have one open. So we'll use it. Go to the path. Okay. And then look right there. Yeah. So the notebooks of today. So yesterday we did from 1 to 6. And today we will do from 7 to 12. And before that, I would I just want to quickly show the the simulations. So yesterday, I I present I I did some simulations to discuss the issues of, of uh, DTI in resolving more than one uh, fiber population inside of the 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 uh, uh, voxel, and the the geometries that was produced on the, the slides uh, are done here on this. A note, notebook and I also have some explanation of what is done here. So I'll quickly show you just for, so the first part is the diffusion spectra imaging and DiPy has uh, some default uh, acquisition schemes that we can use for the simulations. So this is one, one of them. So it's a complete, the DSI is a complete sample of the, of the Q vector space. And if you plot, for example, the B values, you see that it corresponds to a very high B value. So typically in the in the in the scanners, 
we only have a p-value of uh, around 1,000 to uh, 2,000, and here it's one order of magnitude higher. So it's, it's one of the limitations of this, this it's time consumed, and it uses very high um, uh, gradients. So just showing the geometry of it, this is the DSI ODF that is also in the slides. You can rotate them. And then you have also for the key ball constraint solid angle um, reconstruction technique, the constraint spherical deconvolution. So this is also a summary of what was discussed um, yesterday. So today, what we will be focusing is um, another uh, issue of TTI. So one thing is not having a poor uh, angular, um, poor information on the angular uh, distribution of diffusion. Another thing is not representing non-Gaussian uh, diffusion. So I will start today by showing what I mean this with this, with simulations. So just to, 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 to refresh a bit, uh, this is the code that I used also in yesterday simulations to uh, synthetic signals for, uh, for a single tensor. So we are representing the voxel by a single tensor. And in this case, DTI will be, uh, we will be able to fully, uh, fully represent this voxel. Uh, any model in DiPi, you, you again, you need to call it from DiPi reconstruct, in this case, DTI, call what is, what is the model, and then you define it with your GitHub, which summarize the, 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 grade, the B values and B vectors or gradient directions of your experiment. And then after defining that, you can fit your signal. So in this case, I'm fitting the, 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 the synthetic signal that I simulated. So the signal of the single tensor, okay? So here I'm just plotting the given tensor. You can see it. And you can also see, uh, I'm printing here also the statistics. So mean diffusivity, axial radial, and FI. So DTI is able to represent a, a single tensor. Yesterday I showed that when you have crossing uh, tensor, uh, this will um, fail uh, to, to show any of the direction. And also you will have an FA that is much higher than any two of the... Uh, today, let's discuss another issue. So imagine that you still are in the case of one, one uh, fiber population, but now you want also to represent or you want to take into account uh, different uh, media. So in this following example, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing a multi-tensor uh, simulation here in this code here, in which I describe now the signal by uh, two uh, ellipsoids. And you can see this has, for example, if you have a single uh, fiber population, this could be re uh, representative for, of the intercellular and extracellular space. So in very simplest, let's do this toy model. Uh, important to note that uh, each of these tensors will have different uh, axial and radial diffusivities. So I'm defining here the, uh, the Hagen values and both will be uh, simulated with the same direction. So let's plot this. So let's, let's say that this might represent the intercellular space, which you have uh, high, uh, very low diffusivities on the, on, the, on the radial directions due to the, the, the small diameters of typical uh, fibers. And then you have areas that can represent a more hindered space. So diffusion is more free, but it's still affected by the, the barriers. Of course, this is always a very simplistic uh, representation um, of, 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 of diffusion in, in biological tissue. Okay, so for this simulation, I'm, I'm, I'm generating, I'm generating uh, signals for a multi-shell acquisition. So I'm, I'm generating from for a B0 equals zero, a B equals zero, a B, um, uh, till a maximum of a B uh, 2000, uh, uh, just how you can simulate it, produce the signals. And now let's, let's fit the DTI model. So the DTI, it's only able to represent one tensor. So you, you can see this tensor has been uh, average of the, two. 
So you can also compute a ground truth of it. So you can just grab the fraction of, for example, the intercellular space, multiply by uh, the Hengen values, and you will get the expected ground truth of this average uh, signal. So I'll, I will plot this uh, ground truth signals together with the one that is fit. So the first one is the, the fitted one. And the below one is the, 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 the ground truth one. Uh, and you see that the shape uh, alters, it's different from what you, we will expect from the, the ground truth. So DTI is even not able to, to, to accurately estimate the, the, uh, the mean uh, tensor or the average tensor. And yeah, and yes, you can also see this from the fitted Hagen values. Okay, so the reason of, of, of this is because the CISIS no longer is Gaussian. Uh, so what happens is if you will, ex if the system was completely Gaussian, you will expect uh, that the signal decay will, will be a linear decay uh, if you plot on the log scale. So if you remember the slides of yesterday, I showed like Gaussian systems. So for Gaussian uh, systems, you will expect that at a given direction, the, the signal will decay by a non-exponential. So th then the higher B value, the higher will be the decay. But if then you plot this in log uh, scale, you will have a linear decay, the expression that I have. And so this in orange, for a given direction, so I selected the given direction, you see that you have the DTI tries to fit this linear uh, decay with the B value. Uh, however, the signal has a deviation of that. And that is expected because since you have two pools of diffusivities, you have a, uh, one that is faster and one is slower. So one will decay faster and you will have a known uh, Gauss uh, uh, a deviation from this nonlinear uh, uh, decay. So this is where it enters the first uh, model. So um, the, uh, the first model that we will be discussing today is diffusion kurtosis imaging. And what is diffusion kurtosis imaging? Diffusion kurtosis imaging is an expansion of DTI that in addition to estimate a diffusion tensor, it also estimates the, the kurtosis tensor. So to fit this model to the signals, it's the same recipe from the DTI. So you have to call it from the DiPi work construct uh, uh, of, of DiPi and uh, select DKI. And then you have to select what is the, the, the model that you want. So in this case, it's a diffusion kurtosis model. And then you, you can fit it with, give, uh, you can define it with your, your experiments and then fit the, the signal. So now if I, do, if I do this, so now if I fit it, yeah, so this graph changes, changes a bit because the, the gradient table was generated uh, uh, using um, a probabilistic uh, code. So the directions were selected using probabilistic code. Uh, then you will plot a different direction when each time that you run this. So if you want to fix it, you can load, for example, a GitHub of your, your own data. Uh, but yeah, the idea, the idea is DTI is not able to represent the, the ground truth signal in, in, in. However, if you do this, with DKI, then you have a much uh, match. So now let's uh, plot the diffusion tensors estimated from DKI. And so the ground truth is it's, it's the upper geometry. I'll zoom this. The middle one is the DKI fitted and uh, the kurtosis fitted is the, the last one. And you see that the is, uh, matches uh, closely the ground truth. And the reason why is since now uh, kurtosis is taking into account the non-Gaussian uh, effect, it can reach a diffusion tensor uh, estimate that is more accurate. So in addition to this, you're also, yes, yeah, so this is just checking the Hagen values, showing that the DKI one matches close, more closer the ground truth one. And now in addition to having the diffusion tensor, you have also uh, the kurtosis uh, tensor. So I will uh, plot this, the geometry of a kurtosis. So what I'm plotting here is the, uh, if you, you, you reconstruct the tensor and then you extract their values in given direction. So the apparent uh, kurtosis coefficient uh, has function of direction. 
and you will have this kind of donut shape uh, profile. And in and, uh, and pink here, in this, this direction, in pink, I will zoom this, it's the direction of the, 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 the tensor or the, 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 the ground truth direction of the, of the white matter uh, uh, simulate. And what you, see, what you can see is now the maxims of the kurtosis values is on the radial direction. So it's, it's different from the diffusion tensor that you have the maximum diffusivity along the fibers. Here is the other way around because the non-Gaussian effects, you will expect to have them more in the uh, radial direction. So where you have the uh, different compartments and also uh, where the, the water molecules are have the restricted uh, uh, effects or in more degree, okay? Yeah. So. Uh, similar to the diffusion tensor, you can extract uh, different statistics. And so for the DTI, you, you will have the same mean diffusivities, uh, uh, axial diffusivity, radial diffusivity, and NFA, because you have also the diffusion tensor. In addition, you will also you can extract the mean kurtosis, has the kurtosis, the average of the kurtosis of all directions. And then uh, the axial kurtosis, which is the kurtosis along the, the, the fiber or along the main direction. And the radial kurtosis, which is the, the kurtosis value perpendicular to the main axis of the diffusion tensor. So we always use the diffusion tensor as the reference. So in this case, the axial kurtosis, you see that is lower than the radial kurtosis, while in the diffusivities, the, the axial diffusivity is higher than the, the radio. So this simulation was, were done for well-aligned uh, fibers. So now imagine that we have a crossing, right? So for this, I'm now representing each population of uh, fiber by two intra and extracellular compartments. And here are the eigenvalues. Now I have two directions, the fractions of each compartment that have to be multiplied by the fraction of each uh, fiber population. So I'm assuming that they have both the same. Things. And then the F represents the fraction of inter, the, the fractions between inter and extracellular space. So you have to multiply this. So this is the total sum uh, fractions will be equal to, to one or 100%. So let's do the simulations. And now let's see the kurtosis tensor. So yesterday I showed that the diffusion tensor doesn't resolve the the uh, possible crossing fibers. But now the D DKI, the kurtosis tensor actually have the information, a higher angular information. And so what I'm plotting here, so this is the ground truth directions of your system. And you see that now the kurtosis tensor still shows the maximum uh, values radially to each the uh, directions. So even, uh, in 2015, I even had, uh, uh, I, I submitted this, this work, so you can give a read that you can even use this, this information to, to resolve co crossing fibers in tractography. So uh, this will not be uh, uh, explored in this, the tutorials of today, because I want to focus on the, on the scalar quantities. So why non-Gaussian diffusion uh, may be relevant for, for, for you? So why we care about estimating the degree of, of non-Gaussian uh, uh, diffusion? And the answer is this can reflect better the microstructure properties than uh, estimates based on anisotropy. And to show that what I'm doing is, for example, let's assume that in, you have a system in which uh, over time or for example, uh, a, a maturation, tissue maturation, degeneration, uh, something that the volume fraction starts changing. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm repeating the simulations with different uh, uh, volume fractions between inter and extracellular space. And also to have the notion how each metric will depend on the, on the, on the effects of the geom of the uh, ODF or how the, the 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 fibers are distributed along the space, I'm also simulating the two populations with varying angle. Okay, so I'm doing a for loop for different 
in, uh, fraction of inter and extracellular spaces. And then I'm doing also different ang intersection angle. So let's run the simulation. Okay. Let's now reconstruct the FA from the, the DTI model and let's see it's dependent. So this is the FA dependent for different intersection angles in different volume fractions. And you see that uh, a big dependence on the FA, it's indeed uh, the ODF information. So what this means is when you are uh, doing the stud a study and you're assuming that FA is only reflecting microstructural changes, this might not be the case. So for example, if you have uh, some difference on, on uh, the maturation of, uh, imagine that you're studying uh, ma uh, uh, maturation and the, uh, the tracks starting to, to have more vo volume and in the uh, uh, mesoscopic scale, the tracks will have a higher disperse, they have higher uh, uh, volumes. So this will induce the FA uh, to decrease and if you use this, has a, uh, uh, the FA has a target of uh, a tissue maturations and assuming that uh, the FA increase will um, uh, reflect a maturation effect, having this increased dispersion will confound the uh, FA to the, the other direction. So, so you might even have FA decreasing on this type of, of, of studies. So uh, then I did the same thing from the MK. And you see that now MK the, the has a less, less dependence on the on the degree of, of intersection of so I mean the conclusion is that uh, quantifying non-Gaussian diffusion might be uh, advantage because it might be less confounded by uh, um, parameters of how fibers are uh, distributed along the your uh, voxel so if they are aligned and, and crossing and another advantage of of measuring non-Gaussian effects is since now you're analyzing, so kurtosis is estimated or, so use kurtosis to estimate non-Gaussian effect. And this estimate uh, uh, is done from the deviation of this linearity on the signal decay. So it doesn't use the information uh, across the, the space. So one thing that you can even do is you can even average uh, your signals across all directions and only look to the b-value decay of this average. So I'm doing, doing here this. And you see that the average signal will have still this deviation of non-linearity. And why is this important? Because it is known uh, from the literature that uh, average signals are not dependent at all on how, uh, uh, on the shape of your uh, ODF. So if you have crossing fibers or well-aligned fibers and the, the diffusivities of different compartments are exactly the same, this, this signal, the average signal decay will be the same. So you even can do uh, a kurtosis uh, measurement on this on the signals. And this is what I propose, for example, for my, my PGT. And if you run this in the simulations, you see that you completely remove the this effect of uh, of, of, of the ODF. So I think I already uh, talked uh, much. So what I will now ask you to do is to give a look to the first uh, notebook of today. So it's the notebook tutorial 007, Diffusion Kurtosis Imaging. And here you, uh, you will show how you can fit DKI to, um, to your uh, to your data. So yeah. In the meantime, if you have questions about theory, please let me know. And uh, or problems with. Okay. So I think I will start uh, giving around uh, fifteen minutes, and then I will uh, uh, I will double check how you guys doing, and if we proceed or give more time. Okay. So I have a question. Uh, Please could you explain again how different diffusion compartments lead to non-Gaussian signal decays? Okay, so yeah, so so imagine, well, in the example that I show, you have you represent each fiber bum, uh, bundle has uh, two uh, two compartments, right? So each co compartment will have different. Okay, so if you plot 
the, the signal decays of each diffusivity, each one will have a linear decay. If you are able to isolate each compartment and, and show the linear decay, the, the signal decay, you will have in the log scale a linear decay. Uh, one, since it has a faster diffusivity, uh, will decay much faster than the, the other, okay? So now you imagine that you have the, the two systems to, so one will have a faster decay and then one will be uh, slower. So what will happen is in the first part of the, the curve, you will have the sum of, uh, you will have the contribution of, the, of both. And then when one will attenuate almost uh, uh, fully and you still have the presence of the other. So basically, the uh, the log the log signal will deviate from this linearity because you start losing the signals of 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 one, and of course this is also uh, so again uh, this is a very simple it's important to note that this is a very simplistic representation of of, of so for example in this issue you might have other different uh, compartments and also you might have non Gaussian effects inside of the of the of the compartment. So, so uh, imagine, as I told you yesterday, that if you have free water, the Gaussian the water will be uh, Gaussian because it will be freely it will be able to uh, freely uh, uh, diffuse uh, at any uh, distance right, with the probability. So imagine that now you have a confined system that doesn't allow that you have uh, displacements of let's say of. Uh, 10 microns or five microns. This will turn to create the Gaussian. And then if you plot this, this uh, uh, signal decay, then again, you have a deviation from the linearity. So this is another effect that you also have. Um, so kurtosis will uh, estimate the general of, of all this, this, this uh, effects. Oh, true, I forgot to, to, to mention, I want to ask you all, uh, a favor because in one of the future tutorials that we are uh, doing today, uh, so that in the next tutorials, I will also will explore uh, different preprocessing uh, techniques and how they influence different measurements. And for the discussion of one of the of, of the artifacts, uh, I'm I'm loading uh, on one of the tutorials. It's loaded uh, some data that. This artifact is 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 so. Uh, this is the tutorial uh, uh, nine. So what I will uh, ask you to do is, in parallel, when you're working on this this uh, DKI uh, tutorial, if you can uh, run uh, the the shells of this tutorial without reading the code, just running the shells. Uh, you can just press run every every shell. Uh, until shell, um, let me see the number. Yeah, until shell, uh, shell seven from tutorial 0 0.9. And I'm asking this because I noticed that this data uh, might be quite heavy to, to, to download and it will take, if this is downloaded at the same time that we are working on the other uh, tutorials, it will be great. Thumbs up if you got it. Great, perfect. Thank you guys. Oh, sorry. I just have another question here. Um, uh, I was just opening now the Slido and I noticed all. So why multi-shell data is needed for uh, diffusion kurtosis uh, imaging? Well, this is required because you want to capture the known linear information on the decay. So uh, for DTI, you only need one because you only are interested in measuring or trying to measuring this. So for a slope, you need two points, right? So in, in D, uh, standard D, uh, DTI, you needed two points, which was the B, known B0 and the B0. Indeed, you had two. In this case, you have in the DTI, you need two non-zero uh, B values because you want to, to be able to capture a, a concave function, so a, a linear function. So at, if you already had finished, please just answer the, or indicate on Slido that it's you are ready. I uh, just realized that I didn't uh, uh, submit the the the, pool, the the question in, in Slido, so you can answer. Okay, so there are some people that didn't finish it, so uh, I will give uh, until ten thirty, uh, and then we can work on it to, together.
in meantime, for people that are already finished, just feel free to get the coffee or something because I'm also doing the same. I need some coffee. Okay, so for a matter of time, I, let's look to, to the tutorial to, together. Uh, uh, thumbs up for people that are already run uh, but didn't finish the example, but the, the run without... It. Okay, so let's work together on that. Okay, so this, if you see, it follows always the same uh, recipe, even like from the reconstruction that we did yesterday. So uh, the first shells is just to define, to import some of the that uh, we need here. Um, then we load the, the date that this was also the data that we also played yesterday. Um, then we mask the data. Uh, since in DKI, since we are trying to get information um, from the, the difference or the deviation from the, the linear decay, uh, if you see this information might be um, uh, very uh, small compared to the, the overall the, the, the decay. So measuring DKI has, uh, or one of the is, uh, issues of measuring this non Gaussian information is that sometimes it's, it's, it's much noisier than our measurements based on this information are much are noisier than measurements from the anisotropy extracted from different directions because the contrasts here are 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 uh, are lower. So some uh, sometimes what you need to to do it's a more careful preprocessing on the data uh, and uh, a conventional way to 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 boost SNR and on uh, DKI. Uh, was Gaussian uh, uh, smoothing, but later I will ex um, we will look to some um, techniques to to uh, try to increase the SNR of your data um, without removing or blurring your 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 image. But uh, uh, for the sake of let's uh, for starting uh, in this example, uh, I'm I'm doing a Gaussian uh, smoothing here. So has any other model, you just have to first define it. So here we define the diffusion kurtosis model and then uh, we fit it uh, from the fit function of the, the object created. One thing that I want to mention, so all, uh, so you might think that remembering all uh, the names um, might be hard, but keep uh, in mind that the only thing that you, you need to remember is where to get the, the model. So it's from DiPy reconst. Uh, and then there you even can uh, create a tab and look uh, the list of the different uh, models that you have. So show that here below. So if you have try to import and then you press a tab, you have all the, the that you have. So this is the only thing that you have to to keep in mind is where to call the different uh, models. And then after having a model, you also have to know the, um, what is the name of the, the model object, let's say. So in the case of the of kurtosis is the diffusion uh, kurtosis model. In case of TTI was tensor model. So this is the only information that you can get, for example, on, uh, on the different tutorials, on DiPy webpage, and are also if you look to the to the to the source uh, then what i want to mention so then the the names that you you give has outputs it can be any so you can call this dki model or if you're not interested in any other model you can just call this model so this this variable name you can give what what in this the the same here then after defining it then for example, if I call this DKI slash model, then to fit it, I have to call the right variable and then it will have uh, attribute. But again, this always follows the same uh, recipe. So has DKI estimates the diffusion tensor quantity uh, quantities. You can also extract the diffusivities in FA. And what I first ask is to compare um, the, the measurements extracted from uh, DTI, uh, DTI and the tensor from uh, DKI. And you see that the contrast is, is, is 
uh, and this I explain it. So uh, the DKI has, so although it's, it has more parameters to estimate and might be more noisy, let's say. So it has, might have, in precision, it might be worse than D, uh, DKI. In terms of accuracy, so how uh, near to, to the ground, uh, ground truth value uh, of diffusion tensor is, uh, D, uh, DKI is the, the technique that gives you the more accurate uh, tensor. So the, the contrast is different. And so one, one way that you could see the, 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 uh, the lack of accuracy of DTI is, for example, if you isolate uh, the different B values of your data. So imagine that you, you split your data, you have a multi-shell data with different B values and you split it and you fit separately the DTI, you will see that the, the estimates will be different uh, as a function of, uh, of the B value. So it's, it's also the reason why that on, uh, on the DTI literature, uh, there, it was suggested not to uh, fit uh, uh, DTI with very high B values because the lower is the B value, the less you have this non-Gaussian uh, uh, effect. So it's typically we use 1000 and then this is also compromised with the contrast. So if you also reduce too much your B value, then you don't have enough decay and you will have problems on, uh, on percent, okay? And then to fit from the decay fit uh, objects, to fit the, the mean kurtosis, axial kurtosis, it's, it's similar as fitting the other parameters, but now there's a, a slight difference. So now you have to indicate this variable, so zero and three. And what are this, this, uh, this variable? So before you could just like run it like this, right? So for example, if you want to MD, you, you can run it like this. Now you need to specify this. And the reason is because uh, sometimes uh, in some of the voxels that you are particularly uh, uh, noisy, the kurtosis values could, uh, could go out of the ranges, um, of the typical ranges. So let's say that uh, you ex the typical values of kurtosis goes around 0 to 2 to 0.5. Uh, due to some noisy voxels, these values could completely corrupt this, the, the scale. So for example, you will have a, a, a value of Cartos of minus 1,000 or 10,000. And so um, what this does is to concatenate your, your Cartos' values to this range, zero to... to, to, to uh, and this why, because then if you want to do statistics, for example, you want to uh, define a region of interest and then you have a voxel com uh, corrupted, this will completely corrupt the, the mean of that region of interest. So this was a strategy that I decided to do uh, on the implementation. And I didn't want to hide this of, uh, to users. So I really want them to specify to, to for them to, to know that this bounds uh, uh, have to be imposed. So it's just a practical, practical uh, reason. So here I'm, I'm plotting and uh, in, in, in this plot, what I'm, I'm, I'm showing it, it's one of the regions that have this very uh, negative values, okay? It's normally the um, kurtosis sometimes is expected to be high on the white matter, but sometimes you have this black uh, voxels. And uh, this is basically to the, no, the noise effect. And you can imagine that this happens more in white matter because the diffusivities are also low on the radial directions. So if the diffusivities are low, you don't have basically decay and then it's very hard to capture the non-Gaussian. Okay, so that is the reason um, uh, why you see black voxels on the on your data. So in the exercise, what I asked to do is to process the, the DTI fit uh, on the data on the, uh, without smooth and compare it with the, the mean signal uh, kurtosis uh, model. So, so I'm, I'm here I explain where, what is the name of the, the model that you have to call from, from the dipaper construct uh, mean signal DKI. And so, yeah, so here it's basically fitting the non-smoother data 
I note that I, I didn't need to define again the model because the gradient tables were the, the, the same. So I just used the one that was already uh, defined and fitted the new data. And then we have to import the mean signal decay uh, model to compute the mean signal uh, or the cartoon from the mean signal. And this is based, uh, yeah. yeah, I pressed this again. I had run it before. Okay, so I will show in the solution. So this is the two maps that you, you input. So the previous map and the mean signal kurtosis map. So you see that these two uh, metrics are very similar. So both are measuring a isotropic kurtosis, but the first one was estimated from the tensor, while the second one was you first average all the directions uh, for each B value, and then it fits the known uh, Gaussian deviation uh, from, from the mean signals. And so you see that the contrast in Zener is very similar, but it's more clean. And the reason is when you average the, your signals, you're also gaining SNR. So another uh, advantage of metrics here, so a part of removing the, the effects of the, the fiber ODF, it's also being more robust to, to noise. So this is another strategy if you want to improve your uh, kurtosis uh, eximates is to use this. So, so I will just stop sharing a second and double check if there's any questions. If I was not clear with something, uh, please post or even ask now, uh, unmute and ask. Let me double check in Slido if I have. Okay, so what we are now discussing next is uh, uh, different strategies for prepping, okay? So uh, uh, yesterday, I didn't discuss that much of what are the steps that we typically do on the processing of diffusion MRI, because we were using examples uh, uh, from DiPi that some of them already have pre-processing done. So um, I decided to just first explain the importance of do uh, with diffusion MRI first. But I think now, since this is uh, important for the non-Gaussian estimations, I will just show some slides of what is a typical preprocessing that you can do. And then um, we will do some uh, exercises. So typically, so cur the current state of art, let's say, of, uh, of preprocessing of diffusion MRI data that I will be discussing also today, it's uh, you have strategies to denoise your data. So for example, to, to try to increase the SNR of your data. Uh, then there's also a phenomenon that is common by the MRI, which is the Gibbs artifacts. And I will introduce a strategy to correct Gibbs uh, artifacts. And then uh, strategies to correct motion, B0 immunogenities. And so since we are in diffusion MRI, we are dealing with uh, signal decays. The, the diffusion data intrinsically suffers from very low uh, SNR. So you have the diffusion weight acquisition, and then you also need time to locate the additional diffusion gradient. So you will also have longer echo times. Uh, so this all uh, creates uh, signals that are very low, uh, low and then uh, consequently, you will have also low uh, SNR. So there's some uh, strategies to try to suppress the noise uh, that will propagate from, from your diffusion MRI estimates. And the first one, it's the one that we uh, showed in the tutorial, which is just Gaussian smoothing. Um, the, the issue of the Gaussian smoothing is then uh, you also blur your image. So for example, if I, uh, here is a, a raw data, here's the, the smooth, I'm using the same kernel on the, use it on the tutorial. And if you compute, you will see that you're losing some uh, anatomical information, okay? So this is the, the main pitfall of, of this. And then, so you have strategies in DiPi that you, that you can use. So for example, you have the uh, non-local means. Oh, I didn't. Ah, yes. So the, and the, local, and the non-local means, you can find example on the, on the DiPi uh, tutorials, but bas the basic idea is not to try to to, to uh, smooth your, your uh, data with the, the neighborhood, but trying to use this over the brain with uh, a similar information. 
Okay, so this uh, removes less uh, structural information. So as it's shown here, but still some. If you're interested to, to on more details on this, I recommend you to give a look to this uh, to the example. However, in the in this workshop, we, what we were will be uh, showing is the uh, PCI uh, denoising, um, and so this is starting to be very popular uh, in the recent years. Uh, because it actually explores the redundancy of the diffusion MRI uh, data. So what it does, basically it uses a sliding window, let's say, and it treats your image as uh, a, a matrix. So it will reconstruct from this sliding window a matrix of voxels per the, 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 the diffusion uh, experiments, a so different diffusion experience. And the different voxels were, will be taken as different uh, measurements. You can kind of doing, uh, you can do a PCI decomposition on this and analyze which of this uh, principal components on this, on this uh, sliding uh, window, uh, it's not correlated to noise. So high correlation will reflect uh, uh, signals while a low uh, Hagen values of the PCA decomposition will just cross. And if it's only noise, we know the uh, expected probability that this is followed. So this is followed by uh, Marcos Pastor distribution. So basically what the code do uh, does is to try to fit Pastor distribution on the, on the lower Hagen values and see the ones that doesn't uh, that, uh, follow this expected uh, profile. So by doing this, you can exclude what are the noise principal uh, components, and you can produce uh, more clean maps. So for example, this is a look on the tutorials. And if you do the difference, you, you don't see any structural information. So you're basically uh, seem to only be removing uh, uh, noise. So with this, you can gain a sufficient uh, SNR. Uh, one thing to note is these techniques, unfortunately, uh, are not uh, optimal or they're the full capability of this. Uh, it's not yet um, optimal for uh, multi-channel uh, reconstruction. And basically, this is what you have on your on on the clinical scanners, right? So uh, this to say that I hope that in the in the in the near future, when we we are able to solve this this uh, issue of the multi-channel reconstructions, or even having, well, ideally this could even be incorporated with with the clinical uh, scanner if vendors are will will be interested. But I think I, this could, in future, I expect that these models will be uh, much further uh, improved on, on the near future. So another issue that we have is the Gibbs artifacts. Uh, so what is a Gibbs artifact? So in MRI, an image is re reconstructed uh, from the key space, right? So imagine that you have an image, uh, which a uh, phantom image, that will have, it's just a phantom that you added in your scan. And the, uh, the key space that you acquired corresponds to this. But sometimes you are not able to cover the, the, the full key space and you have a much smaller uh, window. So if you're not uh, capturing high enough frames here, the image that you will produce will have this, this kind of uh, ringing uh, effect. And this ringing effect is basically analogous if you convolute the sync function with your image. And so you see this ringing because then when your, your, your image will randomly be sampling this kind of sync function. Uh, uh, the so the, the way, the strategy to correct from this is to try to do uh, sub voc in trying to, to capture the, uh, the places that this function uh, has a, a zero cross. So this is just an example of how this will, will look, for example, in one of the slobs of this data. So this is done in 1D. And this is the corrected, if you do this subboxing procedure. Uh, and then after doing this in different, in the two dimensions, you can combine them and you will have the corrected uh, image. So we will show some 
uh, tutorials uh, with about this. Another thing is the, the issues related to, to motion. So uh, for uh, as, as we already introduced in this, this workshop, diffusion MRI consists of the acquisition of several uh, experiments with several B values and B, B vector. So one, one th thing that you will expect is the, 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 your subject might move during the, the acquisition. So a standard way to correct this is to just do some uh, image registration. So uh, if you're interested in this, there's some uh, registration techniques on, 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 on DiPi. Uh, however, I also want to discuss other issues uh, related to this. So in the above, uh, in the previous slide, I was discussing about the motion misalignments between volume. Uh, but keep in mind that since we are trying to probe dimensions that are in the micro scale, so the, uh, the displacement of uh, molecules moving in, uh, in, 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 the, mic uh, in the micro scales, uh, motion can happen in much higher uh, degree. So the way that uh, we, uh, with our acquisitions, we try to, to overcome these issues is to use uh, the API. So normally diffusion is built on a API. And the idea of API is to measure the full key space at the same uh, time. This have, however, some uh, uh, pitfalls. So you, you're able to measure it on the microscopic scales without having uh, that motion artifacts in the, in the slice. However, the API has a limitation of, uh, of B0 imaging. So the, how one, I don't want to go to the details about the API acquisition, but you use this, this bleeps to, to move very fastly through over the keys. And so what happens is due to the B homogeneities, uh, you will have this type of the, uh, distor distortions, okay? And this will depend on the sense of this, of this, uh, uh, the, the, if these flips were applied negative and, and, and positive. So this is one of the, the, the problems that we need to, to correct. Another uh, other issue is eddy currents. So eddy currents results due to the turning off and on of, of your diffusion uh, gradient. And in your, your hardware is not able to do this sharp turning on and off. So you typically have this, this profiles. And sometimes having these profiles on the other uh, image uh, um, components of your, your sequence, you, you can have your image further distorted. So you might ha have some shearing distortion, some scaling distortion, or even some sh uh, shift. So, Typically, what I do to correct, uh, unfortunately, in DiPi, we, we have very powerful registration tools, but uh, the state of art that I typically use to correct my diffusion MRI uh, data is to use the, the eddy uh, correction uh, tools available in, in, in F. Uh, so if you're interested on correct uh, using these advanced tools I, and you didn't, didn't acquire your data, I recommend you to give a look to their documentations to see what are the requirements of the data acquisitions to be uh, able to apply this type of correction. So for example, you might need to, to acquire a different image with different uh, uh, API um, um, uh, bleep uh, negative and positive. Um, yeah, so I think I already uh, too much. So. The next tutorials that I want you to give a look are the tutorial eight, PCI denoising, where you will be exploring the effects of doing a PCI denoising uh, uh, technique, uh, which it's included in, in, in DiPi. Uh, just a last, uh, last point. Uh, keep in mind that you can use any preprocessing techniques that is, are, are available in, in other packages. So at the moment that you can are able to save it in Nifty, 
Gladpy will be able to 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 deal with it. So if you have want to do other preprocessing that is not including on Gladpy, but you want to include, uh, but is are included in other packets, uh, 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 use them, and then you just read the data on on Gladpy. So I will give uh, 20 minutes um, for working on this this tutorial, and then I will go back to you to see what is the stuff. If there is question, in the meantime, just let me. Yeah, so I have a, a private question um, about the correction of, of Risha noise. Uh, so for the ones of you that don't know what is uh, uh, Risha noise, so basically an in, in, in MRI, um, since you you're typically reconstruct your image by the magnitude of the Fourier trans transform of the key space, the you cannot have negative noise. So what happened in when you start having very low SNR, uh, your expected mean value of that signal will not be uh, uh, zero, but it will be biased to a point. So one thing that uh, if you are dealing with the, uh, signals that are decaying a lot, you, uh, you have to be careful uh, on dealing with the recent noise and trying to to reduce this this confounds, um, so I think in DiPi uh, there's a, a uh, based on the mo uh, moments. So one way to do it is af after you you do your PCI denoising, and keep in mind that PCI denoising should be the first step that you do in your preparation uh, because you need for the correct uh, classification of the of the hanging values. You you need to have the raw distribution of uh, of of the noise. So the to classify the, the classify the hanging values as noisy hanging values, you need them to to perform the PCA and the most raw data possible. So without any manipulation. So after you do the PCA denoising, you can uh, try to correct this recent uh, uh, bias. So I think that I I will I will now. Give a look if we have this, if I can find some tutorials, if I'm not mistaken, that we have. Um, yeah, another thing, we'll be not reconstructing your data uh, with, the, with the magnitude, but that then you need, need to, to deal with the, 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 the key space uh, data uh, extracted from the scanner. And sometimes it's not that trivial to, to, to deal with this type of data. So I will try to look to this to this tutorial and I will send it in the chat. Okay, there are some people that are mentioning uh, that they already uh, finished with the, the tutorial. Um, can you quickly add a thumbs up if you already finished the, the PCI the tutorial? Okay, so I don't have that many thumbs up. I will create the, 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 the pool on the end slide. Um, the ones in the meantime, the ones who already finished, uh, they can also give a look on the on the Gibbs uh, tutorial. So the next tutorial, I already introduced the theory of it, so you can also start exploring that tutorial as well. Okay, I already activated a poll about the progress. So if you reply, at the meantime, I was replying here some questions about rice correction. So if you're interested on that. Uh, see the comments that I left on the chat. Uh, also in the chat, I left a link to uh, to my PhD dissertation. So if you're also interested in reading more about the theory, I hope that this might be also uh, useful for, for, for that. Okay, we have seven replies. Let's give two minutes more and we can work on it together. Meantime, people who finish, uh, work on the the Gibbs the Gibbs tutorial. Okay, so let's look to the tutorial together. Okay, so okay, so in this tutorial, I'm I'm showing how you can process the Markov Joe Pastor PCI algorithm on your data. So here, uh, it just has the previous tutorial. It's importing the relevant uh, models and then loading the data. On this example, I decided to select some of the B values. Uh, this is only because the, to run the entire uh, data, this algorithm was, uh, was taking uh, several minutes. 
So this was just um, f for the context of the, the, the exercise. So to be able to run it uh, uh, on uh, reasonable time. So I, I think it took around two to five minutes max, max to, to pre-process the selected uh, B values. Uh, if you're interested in the noise in all the data, um, uh, you can just uh, then uh, leave it running, uh, for example, during lunch break. Uh, another reason why is because uh, if I use also all the data, it could be it will be hard to see the difference between the denoised and the non-denoised data on the on the uh, diffusion MRI quantities, because if you have enough uh, enough data, so if you have long acquisitions, it might uh, be that the DTI and the DKI model, since it has a few parameters, already cap captures the redundancy of the. So sometimes uh, 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 PCI uh, denoising might not provide benefits if you have ex uh, extent uh, uh, acquisition. And if that is the case, what you might uh, uh, be focusing is perhaps more correcting misalignments between uh, the acquisitions and uh, uh, another motion uh, artifact. So uh, how to call the, the, the Marco Passer PCI algorithm. So you can find it on the model of DiPi denoise. Uh, it's, it's a local PCI, it's called local PCI because it's used local uh, windows. And to define the windows, you, you have to uh, input this var variable, which is a patch uh, radius, okay? So it means that how many uh, voxel neighbors you want to include on the slide the windows in, in comparison to a middle voxel. So if you press it two, it will create two voxels uh, in each side of the, of the center. So it will be a window of five by five by five. And then this is exactly the figure that was on the slides. So showing the residuals. So if you use this code in your data, I really recommend you to also uh, double check that uh, the the PCA uh, is only uh, this algorithm is only giving you residuals. Okay, so for example, if your uh, data had already some manipulations, it might that happen that it's not able to capture uh, well the residuals, uh, the the noise components, and then you will not have. Uh, you will might not be removing signal at, at, at all. A good thing about the PCI, this strategy, is sometimes if something goes wrong, this alg algorithm tries, it's, it's, tends to be conservative. But uh, if there's some uh, thing that is not making, uh, some artifact that is not making uh, this uh, algorithm to run, it will just give you the original data. So it will file to identify the Hagen, uh, Hagen values, the noise Hagen values, it, it will give you the, all of them, and uh, you will basically have your original data. So in the worst case scenario, it will give uh, your original data. So it's also a feature that I, I, I like about this, this, this algorithm. And then during the, the exercise, what, I'm, uh, was, uh, what I was asking you to do is to see the impacts of um, of the, the noise and the noise removal uh, on the metrics. Because even sometimes in your raw data, you, you, you don't know uh, how the, the noise is affecting your voxel or at which, uh, at which degrees. Uh, it's also important to have a notion that this arrows, noise arrows on your raw data will propagate on the, on the metrics. And this can induce uh, big artifacts has the black voxels and the cryptosis. So I asked you to produce for the mean diffusivity, the FA and MK from the uh, the raw and the noise data. So this is uh, how you do it. So basically, you you just need to uh, to fit your the the data. So after importing your model and defining with your GitHub. Then you just you can just fit both. It's always the same recipe, and then extract the different versions of FA and MDMK maps. 
So here is the plots. I just realized that I had a, a typo here. So I already corrected in the code, but I, I will not run this now for sake of time. Um, so um, what you can see is uh, if you don't, if you just compute DKI on the on the on the raw data, you will have you will be completely corrupted with this this negative Kurtosis implausible values. Uh, it improves. It seems to improve a bit when you you use the PCI denoising, and you also see some improvements on the FA from the diffusion tensor extracted by DKI. So another feature that is very interesting about the, the PCI denoising is that you can also use it to estimate your, um, your SNR. So since you are classifying the, the, the noisy hanging values, you can use that information to the, the st standard deviation of, of the variance of the noise. And then you can use it to compute uh, um, the SNR of your data. So below the, the exercise, you can find the code on how to do it, how to do it. So basically you just have to add a return sigma and it will out, uh, output the, the standard deviation of the, of the so This can be very useful if you want to measure the SNR or having a SNR map uh, of your of your so I think uh, we we have twenty minutes until the the lunch break. So uh, what I will ask you is to give a look to the tutorial nine gives uh, an ringing, and then I think I will uh, give the rest of the of the morning for this. So we can start fresh uh, uh, at one with the microstructure model. So at in the morning, I just mentioned uh, some uh, signal representation techniques, the DTI and DKI. And then we will start the afternoon with the, some brainstorming about different uh, microstructural uh, models, what information they provide, different from the signal representation. Uh, so let's focus on this tutorial now. And so I will get back to you. Since we don't have exercises, just re running it. I will get back to you um, five minutes before uh, noon. So we can discuss this together and then we will go to lunch break. Okay, I also want to mention something about the PCI denoising. So if in your data, you see that the PCI denoising is not working properly because uh, the, the raw data has some, uh, it's corrupted and it's not following the that, uh, uh, distribution. One thing that you can try to do to overcome that is to to use the PCI with empirical uh, threshold. So basically, the idea is that in, instead of uh, trying to classify the no noisy components of your signal, what you do is you first estimate. The, the 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 noise variance of your of your and then you can input that as a threshold for the PCI. So I left on the chat um, an example that is on DiPi uh, explaining how to use this empirical uh, tr uh, threshold. So if the uh, Markov uh, Mark capacitor uh, PCI algorithm doesn't work properly, you can also try to use uh, this uh, empirical uh, threshold. So saying that, and before going to, to lunch, uh, let's see together the tutorial about. So thumbs up for people that were able to run till the end of that tutorial. Okay. So there's some people missing, but so it's still taking time to, to, to run. You can try to, leave it running um, during the lunch uh, break, but let's give a look together what I intended to it. So to show the, the effects, the first thing that this example does is to look to it on a, a standard um, a structural image. So this algorithm can also be applied. It's not spe uh, specific for, for uh, diffusion MRI data, but also for uh, other type of data. So for example, if you're using uh, also fMRI and you 
your concern that keeps ringing might be uh, an issue. Uh, you can also use this for that or any other structural. So the data that, yeah, so the data that is the, the downloaded was acquired with a high uh, field of view and we didn't see that much, we cannot see that much the ringing effects. So for just uh, educational uh, purpose, what I did was to truncate half of the key space. So this is done, uh, the key space here was uh, reconstructed uh, using the um, Fourier transform. Um, and then I just cropped it and then applied again uh, the, the Fourier transform to have uh, T1 corrupted in. And then to, to run it, you just need to run the Gibbs removal, uh, removal that can also be called, you can see it here, from the DiPi denoise uh, tools. Um, and uh, here is the plot of the results and the difference. So you can see that you have now ringings here and these are highlighted when you compute the difference between the, the, the ground truth and, um, and the uh, truncated uh, uh, for, uh, Fourier uh, key space version of the data. So then uh, in this tutorial, I wanted to show the effects of having Gibbs ringing on, on your diffusion data. And uh, for that, I'm downloading uh, the a data that was acquired in, in, in Sunir. So it's a lab in, in, in France, if I'm not mistaken. And I noticed that this data was, was uh, had this. So uh, for computing speed, I'm only selecting uh, two slices of this state, this example. So if you want to write, uh, run it in all, you just need to uh, take this out or just run it on the entire data, okay? And here is the, the, the of the corrected and, uh, and, and corrected data. And you see that indeed it, it has, the difference shows that there's some, there was some ringings. And you see from the, the measurements, when you extract the, the mean signal DKI kurtosis index, you could see that indeed this ringing was inducing some of the negative uh, kurtosis values of the, uh, of the data. And this disappears, for example, here. The artifacts related to, to that disappears when you run this. And if you subtract, then you can, uh, the, the corrected and uncorrected, you can see this this ringing. So the last thing that I also want to point about this code is on if you look to the uh, original article that is proposing this. So this was Kellner, and you can see the reference on the slides. And also I'm pointing here, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. So you can press here, and you will go. It will follow for the for that uh, article. Uh, this algorithm uh, assumes that you're not uh, using uh, a huge uh, partial uh, uh, Fourier on your acquisition. So if uh, you, you think this artifact is relevant uh, for your, your data and is a possible compound of your results, uh, I will recommend uh, you, if you had the opportunity to not use that or trying to minimize as possible the, the, the partial Fourier on your uh, acquisition for, uh, for, for, of course, that if you use uh, some, this still might uh, be able to detect some amount of ringing, but there will be a, uh, a time that, or a degree of partial Fourier that this will start failing and not doing any correction and only doing kind of a, a smoothing uh, effect on your data. So I think this is a, what I wanted to show in the morning. And in the afternoon, uh, um, I want to let's talk about microstructural modeling and also what is the difference of the microstructure modeling in the previous models that we, we discussed uh, this, this morning. So let's meet in one hour. We will be discussing about microstructure models and just to have a more general perspective between the models that we, we discussed previously, uh, I will show uh, 
a short presentation. So share the screen. Okay. So, so there are basically two types of uh, models that we use on diffusion MRI. And so this, uh, all the models can be classified uh, uh, under these two um, types. So the first one is the one that we discussed this morning, which are phenomenological models, uh, which are models that doesn't provide you a direct link with biological properties, but instead focus on characterizing and summarizing the pro properties of uh, di uh, diffusion. Um, the other type is mechanistic models, or some authors define as the microstructure models. And in this case, the models try to make a direct link using mathematical models with the signals and biological um, So even there's uh, some authors that even when talking about the first type, the phenological models, they even say that it's we should not call them a model uh, at all because they don't have thick uh, uh, microstructural mathematical. And so they just use this signal representation definition. So if you want to more uh, know more about uh, the the difference of these two, two, two type of models, I recommend you to, to give a look on this review paper uh, by Dmitry Novikov, uh, Valerich Kesevelich, and Suna Jesperson, uh, where they 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 do a review of uh, current limitations and uh, and the tool. So just for a recap regarding the signal representation, so we it's focused on uh, quantifying the properties of uh, diffusion. So as I showed. Uh, the diffusion tensor tries to quantify the anisotropy of the diffusion. And so for this, you basically need to have the information of several directions in a non-zero B value. So you can target at, at different uh, directions. And for, for that, you can do a DTI reconstruction or for example, the Hardy reconstructions that um, I explained yesterday. Uh, then we have the example of the decimation of Kurtosis uh, metrics. In this case, uh, you will also need to, to, to get different directions to represent the three-dimensional geometry or an isotropy of the system, but then also different B values to quantify the deviation of the log signal that reflects uh, uh, the non-Gaussian uh, properties of diffusion in, in, in tissue. And I show that you can, for example, measure the curve we have here uh, below. Okay. So, also to point, and it's a summary of what we discussed this morning. So, the advantage of measuring non Gaussian measurements compared to the anisotropy on, in the following way is that, uh, for example, non Gaussian properties will be present in even in voxels that have. Lower uh, uh, low coherence. So, for example, if we think about uh, uh, voxels of the gray matter that doesn't have the the major microstructural line, uh, the FA will not be able to 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 capture uh, changes, while the mean kurtosis uh, will uh, still. So, under the assumption that uh, a tissue uh, under maturation will have more barriers, or and the tissue is more uh, mature. If you do this this simplistic approximation, uh, an increase might reflect uh, maturation, while a decrease degeneration. In this, I'm showing a plot that I, I extracted uh, from my uh, master dis dissertation, where I look to the, the changes of mean kurtosis with age, and you see that indeed you have an increase and then decrease. And note that this information is different from the diffusion. So the diffusion seems to be uh, increasing uh, since the early beginnings. So this provides different information as well uh, and is able to track changes in opposite to FA. The other thing is since the known uh, Gaussian uh, properties are present, even if you average the signals, and this was discussed this morning with the mean signal uh, kurtosis, this have the extra advantage of that you don't depend on how uh, the uh, what is the ODF of, of, their, of your system. So if fibers are crossing, or if they are well aligned. So you remove uh, this confounding factor 
And it might be important if you just only want to characterize uh, changes in the microstructural uh, uh, property. So, okay. So just to show a practical, so this is some plots that I, uh, I extract from my PhD. And this is uh, the whole uh, white matter of the CAMCAN uh, project. And uh, I showed this plot yesterday regarding the FA, and you see that you have this early decline, declines from 20. While in the mean kurtosis, you see that these declines are not present at the beginning. So this indicates that the, the measurements or the decli initial declines of FA are indeed a compound of the, the high dependence to the changes uh, on the mesoscopic and microscopic uh, scale of brains and knowing that uh, the volumes of brains are expected to, to increase until up to the 40 age. Uh, how, why these measurements can be important. However, one cannot conclude uh, what, so we know that it, it cannot be a change on the, the ODF, this MSKI index, but we still cannot uh, distinguish if this maturations or degenerations um, uh, are, uh, are related to different biological uh, mechanisms. So attempt to do this, uh, you can start looking to the Microsoft uh, models. And this, as I said previously, try direct um, microstructure properties by fitting mathematical models on signals. So if you look to the literature, you see that there's many models being uh, proposed in the last uh, uh, years. And so sometimes people ask me, oh, so what is the right model? Or what is the, uh, the, uh, what should I use for my data? And so one thing that, the first thing that we have to take in, in, into account is sometimes this model have common aspects. So all of, uh, all of the, uh, the, uh, the, them, typically try to fit a number, a number of compartments, uh, typically assumed to be Gaussian. And yeah, so this is uh, one example. So this is the same model that I use on the simulations of this mo uh, model for the, for the forward representations of signals. And now here we are trying to do the inverse. So we are trying to, to fit this to the signals. And so in this model, you can see like, for example, you can, uh, interpret one of the compartments uh, as being uh, an extracellular, an intercellular. Um, and yeah, and most of these models on this list all have the common, uh, have some common basis. So typically they uh, assume one to four maximum uh, number of compartments. And, uh, and then they just change on the types of constraints. So. Uh, some of them will 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 uh, include a extra free water term uh, to try to exclude the, um, the free water uh, partial volume effects from the the parenchyma or CFS. Some others uh, will have uh, will try to estimate that all the the uh, tensor eigen values of each compartment, but then they have to re have to reduce the number of compartments. So there's always a common uh, base on, on on this, and you have to impose constraints to be able to extract information because the diffusion MRI data is limit it has limited information that it can pro uh, provide, and we will show that in the next slides. Another thing that I want to point is that this uh, sum of a number of compartments. So for example, here is the expression. So imagine here, I only have two fiber population in each one with two media, but you can add the how many uh, uh, compartments in theory, but in practice, then you're not able to, to, to fit it. But another way that you can represent this, this equation is using the framework, the same fr framework of the theoretical deconvolution uh, equations that I showed you. So uh, this can be decoupled by the fiber ODF. So what is the, uh, the directions of your uh, fiber populations? And then you will have a kernel that will have the diffusivities of, of if each fiber uh, population. Okay, so yesterday on the constraints variable to convolution, we were concerned on 
on fitting the fiber ODF by fixing the kernel parameters. The microstructural models, you can see it has the other way around. We try to, we focus on the estimation of the, the kernel and sometimes we impose uh, assumptions on the, on the ODF, okay? So this is just uh, to show that the information fit the models. You cannot uh, fit an uh, uh, infinite number of, of components because you need to understand what is the degrees of freedom that the, your diffusion uh, uh, data gives. So, some, uh, so if you see the directions gives you the information of the, can be seen as giving the information of the F, while the non-Gaussian properties gives you the information of the, of the kernels. The, the number of parameters that you estimate have to match the, the degrees of freedom of your data. And I will show this. So, so the example of the microstructural models that I will show today are here. So I will talk first about uh, Nodi and then the uh, spherical mean technique, white matter integrity model and free water uh, DTI. The Nodi model, so what it tries to do, to do so it uses the information of multiple uh, uh, gradient directions and also multiple B values. And so what it does, so in this kernel, uh, uh, ODF and kernel representation, what it does, so it assumes a given ODF. So it says that is a Watson distribution. And what is it, the Watson distribution? It's basically a Gaussian distribution. It's analogous to the Gaussian distribution, but in the, in the spherical uh, coordinate system, okay? So this model just represents the ODF by one peak. And then uh, the parameter that it will estimate from the information of the direction is how dispersed it is. So this orientation dispersion index will vary from zero to one, while zero is one is perfectly uh, aligned. So this, or one when this uh, will be uh, a ball. Let's say. And then with this, then the non-Gaussian information will be used to fit the the extracellular uh, uh, parameters. So it focuses on the Bloom fractions of it. So you have the, the Bloom fraction of the intracellular space, the, then it's the inverse for the extra space. And then for a correction of partial volume effects from CFF and parenchyma, uh, you also estimate a free water uh, term that then is correct. If you see here, you have three parameters. And if you see the log signal has, uh, so the V0 information, it has the slope and a deviation from the slope. So basically you, uh, you cannot estimate more than like two to three parameters. And so several constraints are imposed and what is uh, is the values of the diffusivities, okay? Uh, so this, yeah, so this is here is the, the for example, assumes that uh, tissue, the intercellular space is sticks, so that the dimensions in the radial directions on, of, of copulation is, 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 is small, so the diffusivity is zero. Then you have a constrained diffusivity along the, the accents. And then for the extracellular space, there's a function that only depends on these constraints on the Bloom fraction. So it's, uh, it's um, no new parameters. So the parameters are estimates are just the Bloom fraction. So the F and the FW, plus the orientation uh, index, okay. So then there's, there were other, uh, so one of the limitations is assuming a given ODF. So for example, if you have crossing fibers, this ODF will fail to, to have multiple directions. So then uh, more recently, there was the spherical mean uh, strategies that basically suggests that you average the information of your, um, of your directions. And in this case, these signals will be independent to the ODF. So you don't need to introduce any model. Uh, then for the, for the kernel parameters, you had to impose some constraints. Why? Because again, you only have this non-Gaussian information to infer from, the, from your, your, your models. So what is uh, constraint? Yeah, so it assumes that you have axial diffusivity, the same axial diffusivity inter and extracellular space, and that the, the, the radial diffusivity is again set to zero, while in the extracellular space, the radial diffusivity is given by 
the tortuosity uh, uh, assumption. So in my uh, recent uh, work, uh, I showed that uh, this, the Bloom fraction is actually being completely determined by the the the, Carto the mean kurtosis of uh, so the kurtosis of the the mean of the mean signals so the the technique that I, I introduced uh, this th this morning so giving that on the first tutorial I will show how we can reconstruct the SMT model directly from the uh, uh, mean signal um, uh, DKI uh, 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 model. Yeah, so the tutorial is, is tutorial uh, 10. It's a very short uh, example. So I will just give uh, like five minutes so you can like run it and, uh, and read it and then we can look to get together and continue with uh, my presentation. Okay, I think I will uh, proceed with the showing, working with you with the showing the tutorial. Yeah, so it was a, a very quick. So basically, what I'm showing here is, uh, yeah. So these measurements can be are already being computed on the mean signal uh, DKI uh, uh, model. So what you basically need to do is well process the data. Right. This is the, the previous example where we defined the MS DKI model and fit the data. And the SMT parameters can be defined on, after you fit by these three uh, uh, attributes. So F it gives you the what it was supposed to be the, the axonal water fraction. And then you have the intrinsic diffusivity, which is the diffusion. Um, Inside or um, parallel to to the um, to the uh, intercellular spaces, which is set to be equal to the extracellular space, and then you have also this measurement, which is the called the microscopic uh, FA. So, in general, what is a microscopic anisotropy? Mic microscopic anisotropy in the literature is analogous to the FA, but if you don't take into account of dispersion or crossing. So in the intuitive way, you can think as the micro FA has aligning all your structure in the, it's the given FA of if you align it all your, your, your structure, okay? So this is the maps that by this model. And so you can see that the Bloom fraction is, has this very similar contrast as the uh, mean signal kurtosis uh, Index. So it, this indicates that it's giving exactly the same information, but uh, and uh, the same has the the micro FA. So the contrasts uh, where you see higher values is of of mean kurtosis is where you saw, see the higher values of the micro FA uh, uh, measurements. So uh, then I add here some notes. So this uh, metrics can uh, uh, might be useful if you want to scale. The non Gaussian information in the a scale from zero to one. So it's a kind of a normalized, normalized version of the mean signal uh, uh, kurtosis. But you, you have to be very careful on the interpretation because we know that kurtosis can uh, change uh, by other reasons than just change on the, the Bloom fraction of fibers. So um, uh, so this measurement doesn't gives you exactly the axonal water fraction. Uh, so the name can be a bit uh, uh, misleading. Okay. So what are the things that we can? What other models that uh, we can uh, use? Yeah. So this. Yeah. So before going to other models, yeah, this is the same results for the aging that I showed previously. But now I'm also plotting instead of the SMT1, I have the Bloom fraction of Nodi and the orientation dispersion in index. Uh, although my previous the work relating SMT1 my, uh, by uh, with the mean signal DKI uh, model was done based on SMT, I already did um, it for Nodi, and you have a similar relationship. So what indicates is 
if you see the information that you captured by the, this boom fraction is exactly the same captured before by the, uh, the mean uh, signal kurtosis index. So again, careful with the interpretation. Though, um, though I'm doing this critic on, on microstructural models, uh, this still can be uh, very useful. For, so for example, I think one of the big achievements of the diffusion MRI is the fact that we were able to, or realized that the information that uh, the non-Gaussian information can provide in some degree information that doesn't depend on this ODF. So for example, if I observe the orientation distribution index of knowledge, you see that indeed it increases on early uh, age, uh, aging. So this might be the reason or is likely the reason why you, we see the, the declines of FI. So it was not the microstructural change. Though still, it's hard to interpret what is the micro change. Is it axonal loss? This is uh, demalination. So this is still something that we uh, ha as a community still have to, to explore which are the models that are able to, to distinguish this different uh, mechanism. So another model that we have also in, in DiPi is the white matter track integrity. So here, what it uses, so now it's not, it's not used on the powder average uh, information of the, of the data. Instead, it's focused on regions where you expect that fibers are well aligned. So for example, in the mid sagittal of the corpus callosum. And in this way, what this model uses, it uses the information of the diffusion tensor and the, oops, this is a typo, the kurtosis tensor. And with this, so you use the axial radial uh, uh, diffusivities and the axial radial kurtosis, and you see that you have four degrees of freedom. And under this assumption, then you can extract more parameters than the previous uh, 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 model. So for example, you can have a different divisivity in the inter and extracellular uh, compartment, or let's say the slower and the faster compartment. Uh, and you also are free to estimate the radial uh, diffusivity of the, uh, of the faster uh, uh, compartment. And for example, we can define from their measurements as a tortuosity. And though this model might have constraints that uh, current studies are showing that is not true, like for example, assuming that intercellular space has a lower diffusivity along axons that, than the extracellular space. So recent studies are showing that this might not be true. Although this, in terms of parametric me measurements, several studies has showed that this still can be sensitive to different information than the DKI. So, the next tutorial is teaching you how to fit this model. So it's tutorial 11, okay? So here it's more complex than the, the, the previous one. So I will give uh, 15 minutes and then I will uh, drop in and, and to see what is the start of your progress, okay? So how everyone is doing? Did anyone already finished? If yes, thumbs up. Person, two, three, four, five. Okay. So I think most of you already ran it. So let's discuss it together. Okay. So in this uh, tutorial, again, we load the data, same, da same data has the DKI example. Uh, here I'm uh, using just uh, the Gaussian uh, filter to improve the, the robustness. However, feel free, uh, if you're interested on in using this model on your data, to just try to use the, the more advanced denoising techniques that we learned this, this, this morning, okay? So again, it's always the same recipe. So you have, uh, so I, this, this model, so although in the recent, uh, 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 studies using this model, start calling this the white matter track integrity model. Uh, in DiPi, this is defined as the DKI micro. And why? Because it's a microstructural model ex uh, fitted from the diffusion uh, tensor and kurtosis. So it's why we decided to use this uh, name. Uh, personally, I do see interpretation of the measurements should be taken 
uh, with care because we uh, the constraints of the um, of the model might compromise the meanings of the of the parameters. Uh, I prefer using this terminology. Um, but in 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 the literature, if this model is typically referred to as WMTI, just a, a, a note. So it just fits the the model. Um, one thing also to to uh, you have to keep in mind is this model can be only applied on uh, well aligned fibers. Uh, so it's where where this the composition from diffusion tensor and kurtosis tensor two the two. Uh, diffusion tensors uh, hold, uh, and for that I'm using a, here a criteria a criteria of um, of uh, inclusion, uh, or on the other way, uh, let's say exclusion, since this is the uh, fault. And and this criteria was defined from the uh, first uh, paper uh, that introduced this model, so it's uh, described in Fermat's 2011. Uh, however, you can use any other criteria or adjust uh, this. If you see that this is not enough to select well-aligned fibers, you can you might need to readjust a bit the the values. But what this 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 metrics reflect? So this is these are measurements that you can even extract from DTI. So this is analyzing which voxels uh, uh, have. Um, Tensors that are uh, looking like uh, uh, well elongated uh, uh, ellipsoids. So, in the first quantity, which is the the coefficient of linearity, it's a value that goes to zero to one, and it's it's one uh, when it's completely a stick. So we try to hold all uh, or remove all the voxels that have a coefficient of linearity uh, low, a low coefficient linearity. Then you also have the coefficient of planarity, which indicates uh, one if it's near to a, a plane, so a, a disk. So you have two uh, Hagen vectors that uh, are equal in the smaller one. And so you want also to remove tensors uh, that look like um, a, a disk. And then the last one is thresholding uh, tensors that look like uh, spheres, OK? So this is the way how we define the well-aligned mask. But you can also define region of interest if you're interested. Yeah, and here I'm just extracting the what is the called the axon water fraction in the tetrosity and plotting it on the overlay, has overlay and the mean kurtosis maps. So yeah, so this here is the values. So. If you're interested in uh, knowing what different information this these measurements can give you in in practice, I will recommend you to 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 read the the following uh, articles that have diff of this model and how you can use this as a complement uh, uh, of your DKI uh, analysis. Okay, so I know that the Herber is from. A study on development. This study here is in the Alzheimer's that they can distinguish using this me measurements um, uh, Alzheimer's uh, patients from uh, a mild uh, uh, cognitive impairment. And then we have this uh, in application of. Uh, so the other model that I wanted to talk today is the free water DTI uh, model. Um, some people even classify this as a hybrid model. So it's the objective is not to extract uh, microstructure products such as the axonal water fractions or different diffusivities inside different uh, 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 microstructure pools or TCPs. The the uh, TC pools. The idea is to remove from the DTI analysis a uh, large uh, confounding effect from uh, uh, free water. And why this is important. So, for example, if you think about an aging study that in the late, later age you have gross atrophies and you have the enlargement of the ventricles, if you define regions of interest, you will see that you will have a, a large amount of in the uh, a larger amounts of voxels in the boundaries 
of uh, tissue and the ventricles than on um, a more young cell. Uh, so the way how to try to estimate the, the uh, a tissue um, uh, tensor independent to this contamination is to use the free water model. So basically it's, it represents your standard diffusion tensor model and it adds a free uh, water com compartment uh, in which diffusivity is set to the known uh, diffusivity coefficient of free water. Okay, so then from that, you can extract the standard DTI parameters, the axial radial and mean diffusivity and FA, now decoupled from the, this free water effects. And another advantage of this, so for example, you could also suppress free water using different acquisitions, as, as flare acquisitions, but this has advantage that it also provides the bloom fraction of water. And studies have uh, shown that this might provide a more sensitive measurement to the to disease. So this is an example of a study that was a Parkinson uh, uh, disease, okay? So with this goes the following in the next tutorial. So it's tutorial uh, 12, free water DTI. I will give, so I will, in 10 minutes, I will uh, ask you about the stuff and then we can resume. So I got a question on Slido about the difference of, uh, of the free water DTI implementation in DiPi uh, versus their original uh, in, uh, method proposed in 2009 by Offer Pasternak. So this I will be explaining in the, after the showing the tutorial. So I have a slide uh, discuss. Okay, so how people are doing with the tutorial? The ones who already run everything. We have two that already run, three. Okay, we have half that already run it. We'll give just one more minute and we will discuss the free water DTI and also what is the difference with the, the original implementation. Okay, I will start sharing. Okay, so yeah, so it's the first shells is just loading the data. Okay, yeah, so this, all this, the lines of code till the six shells are are very similar as previous tutorials. Then this is the way, this is the name of the model under uh, the free water DTI uh, uh, model that can be imported from DiPi Reconstruct. So yeah, here, then we fit the data. So you can see that's the, one of the punchlines of this workshop is DiPi in all models follow always the same, okay? So now, to, to compute the FA decoupled from free water uh, contaminations, which is called the FA attribute, and the same for the mean diffusive. Then I'm also doing a comparison with the, the, the standard uh, DTI uh, model. And here uh, are uh, its plots. So yeah, here is the FA measurements from DTI, uh, from DTI and this is from free water DTI. And you see that in general, uh, the FA estimates are, are higher when you compute it from the free water uh, DTI. This is a, um, uh, this is a, uh, exp uh, well, they're, they're, hi they're higher in only in, in some of the, of the, and some of the regions near to the, to the parenchia. Uh, 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 and you can also see uh, the mean diffusivities. Here, the mean diffusivities from the free water DTI has a lower diffusivity, and this is because we are taking out the component of the free water part, and then we are competing the, the, the difference, and this is the free water uh, volume with the expected higher uh, volumes on the ventricles and in and, and parenchia. So one thing that uh, it's important to, to, to notice in this model is sometimes you see this very high F, FA values near the boundaries of CSF and the, and the tissue. And the reason of, of that is when you decouple on the model the information of the free water from the remaining tissue, the signal of what it remains will uh, have uh, 
a very uh, residual signal. So let's say that is 70% is uh, water. So you only have of the signal remaining. So the SNR will be very low. And when the SNR is low, it seems to be overestimated, okay? Because you have kind of a repulsion of, uh, of the Hagen values uh, when, uh, when you have very low uh, SNR. So a way to, to remove this uh, implausible high, high FAs in the boundaries is just to add a threshold uh, based on the FA, uh, your uh, bloom fraction. So here in this example, I'm just excluding all uh, values that had a, a, a free water larger than 70%, okay? So yeah, then, yeah. So this is the then plotting again the results and you see that the, the, high, the high values are removed after you... you... Now, it's between... Uh, the original implementation pr uh, proposed uh, by Pasteur in 2009 in this one. So here, uh, the free water um, model is extracted from the, uh, so it uses the non-Gaussian information uh, of tissue to, to decouple the two compartments, okay? So as I explained this morning, uh, when you have two compartments, it's, it rises a non-Gaussian effect uh, so basically a deviation for the, the single uh, one part decay. So a, a single uh, mono-exponential decay. So in theory, you need to have multi-shell uh, acquisitions to be able to extract two pools um, uh, to, uh, so any compartment that has two uh, comp uh, compartments with different divisivities, you need to, to have to provide information of the of of multiple B values, and also I mentioned here that while in kurtosis the typical B values that you you use goes up to uh, uh, two thousand, so you are able to probe the non-Gaussian information of tissues. Here in the free water DTI uh, model, uh, normally typically suggested to uh, target uh, values that are lower. Why? Because the free water diffusivity is quite fast. So the the comparison of the the the, the, the free water decay with the TC de decay already provides enough contrast in the beginning of the of the of the signal decay. So and you should avoid using very high B values. Why? Because then you also have the non-Gaussian effects that comes from the from the tissue. Okay, so uh, uh, in typical free water, multi-shell, uh, if you're interested on this, you should not go to the same uh, uh, values, B values that you use for diffusion kurtosis uh, uh, imaging. Okay, so compared to the original implementation, so I have here the slides. So here's the article. So if you want to give a re read. So in this implementation here, the free water is, uh, we try to fit the free water using just single shell uh, information. So only one B value. So in this case, the model, since you don't have this uh, B value, multiple B value information in the deviation of linearity, the model it's known to be uh, ill-posed. So you, you don't have a unique solution when you try, uh, the model will not have a unique solution if you try on this type of, uh, of, of, so what it uses, uh, so to try to overcome this, what it uses is kind of spatial regularization and it relies a lot on the initial, uh, a good initial solution guess. So I'm pointing here uh, uh, the work by Mark and, 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 and Rita Nunes. So from the um, technical of, uh, of Lisbon, and uh, in Mark's uh, project, his object was try to have this implementations in, in, in DiPi. Uh, and so he, he succeeded on that. And there's a PR under uh, review with, with, the, with, with the code. Uh, however, uh, we also careful and analyze the, the accuracy of these models and, and simulations. And it's important to note that it should use this technique with specific care. So uh, why? Because uh, 
sometimes an increase on the free water measure, measured by this model doesn't a true uh, increase on free uh, free water. And to test this, we did some tick or simulations. So we generate uh, a typical brain te template, and we add just uh, arbitrary um, uh, lesion. So basically two different. In the first one, we introduce on the white matter a lesion which grant just due to the free free water. While the second type of lesion, we incre induce increase of mean diffusivity. So and then, so this is the ground truths, and then we have the the single single shell uh, algorithm has implemented according to the extraction of the 2009 paper, and then we also apply it in the multi shell version of the data and compare it with the the code that you just uh, run, and as you see. Uh, all the algorithms, when you have this ground truth that is only increase of a real free water, all the algorithms are able to do it, okay? So the issue is when the change is not, the ground truth change is not due to free water and due to mean diffusivity. So the, the code, the multi-shell code is able to distinguish the, it's able to, to be specific to the type of, though, the single shell will always uh, indicate that is uh, increase uh, erratically. It will indicate that it's a decrease of free water. So any change of the t of typical mean diffusivities will be reflected as uh, a change of free wa uh, free water. So if you're interested of doing free water uh, analysis, you and you only have single shell uh, data, uh, careful in interpreting these results. So uh, you still can use this if you, for example, know a priori from previous histological work that this is a change. So the change is indeed due to the free water. So in this case, then you you still can use uh, the this this model. Okay. Now, so this was the models that I this I wanted to discuss today. It is important to note to all the models that I showed here had like. Uh, just uh, a few parameters, so it, it had to in, in, induce some of of uh, amount of constraints. So, for example, DTI, uh, the sorry, the Nodi uh, constrained all the diffusivities, focusing on bloom fractions. Then we have the the SMT uh, model that uh, focus on estimating the intrinsic diffusivity in bloom fractions, and we showed also the white matter integrity that. Uh, is able to to estimate three diffusivities, but assumes that you have a well-aligned fiber system. Uh, but you can't increase the number of parameters to estimate if you give more information uh, or you acquire more data. So we have an example of models has the limonade that goes to much higher B values um, than we typically. Uh, use in, in clinic. And for this, it, it's able to uh, fit the, all the diffusivities of the, of the double, uh, the white matter track integrity model. And then another strategy is to give information, for example, changing the TV diffusion time. So, and all the, the models that, uh, that I discussed in this workshop were, uh, were assuming that you only change the B value and this B value is due to change on the gradient. You should not be changing the diffusion time uh, on different B values because then you're probing different times on the on the diffusion uh, um, uh, phenomena. So uh, here, by incorporating different, also different diffusion uh, times in addition to different gradients, you can try to be. Uh, to measure the, for example, the dimensions of uh, of axons of S caliber and ac active X, and one can also uh, repeat inform uh, can give information of multiple uh, uh, TEs. So you can have also the information of the T to uh, weighted decays on your on your model. And I'm just pointing an example of the TED TED model that used this. Or one thing that is getting uh, very popular uh, in uh, recent uh, uh, literature is the use of non-conventional sequence. So going behind these two pulses of gradients. Uh, of 
Okay. So basically we have an hour uh, till the end of the uh, what was programming uh, for this, this. I decided to reserve the last hours for discussing of other tools or to have an overview, a quick overview of other tools that we can fi find in, 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 in DiPy. So I don't have any more uh, uh, tutorials. Uh, if you're interested um, on trying to run off this, some of these tutorials on the following uh, hour, we can also uh, do this. But uh, I will give you an overview. And also, I want uh, to, to know if you have some questions about what was uh, uh, explained today uh, about the tutorials, about the theories of, uh, of different models. So all uh, thumbs, thumbs up if everything was clear till now. So I see that. OK, so I will show, like, I briefly also met. So in the, in the, in the schedule, it's mentioned that uh, um, I will be talking how to combine different information um, on DTI, uh, sorry, on uh, microstructural eximate models from tractography. So, uh, I will show some examples that we have in in, in DiPy how to 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 do that. Um, so there's a lot of things that I didn't have the opportunity to explain. Uh, I didn't. I will. Yeah, for the format of the. So for example, if you go to the DiPy page, if you're in, in interested on in, in this type of techniques and you want to know what is in. On DiPy, I will really recommend that you you give a look on the tutorials. Uh, I also do that. I regularly sometimes, uh, after three months of development, I also uh, review what is new, and there's there's constantly new things happening. Uh, so, for example, if you go to reconstruction, you can find other models that. Uh, uh, we didn't touch, like for example, um, one thing related. So, yeah. So, for example, in this tutorial here, so crossing environment uh, environment fiber response function with forecast. So, in this model, so it's basically what what it does is tries to estimate the kernel in the ODF. It's a model to estimate the kernel and the ODF at the same time. So for this, it assumes that the kernel is only a response function. So the same thing that you you do with the, the standard constraint spherical uh, deconvolution that you have uh, a single uh, fiber response and then you try to do con uh, the, the convolve. Here, uh, we don't uh, we don't fix the axial diffusivities and uh, uh, ra uh, radial diffusivities. Uh, or try to estimate it a priori. Here, this tech, it's it, it was designed to measure it at the same. So the only the so it requires multiple B values because you need to give you the, the non-Gaussian degree of freedom so it's able to estimate the the kernel values. And if you see, it will so this is the the parallel diffusivities that this model model gives the perpendicular diffusivities, the fractional isotropy. Uh, so this is micro-FA, actually. It's the, uh, it's the FA measurement uh, decoupled from the, from the orientation distribution functions. And at the same time, you will also have the ODFs uh, estimate. OK, so one of, one of the limitations here is that uh, the kernel is only assumed to be one component. So it's with no uh, degree tries to characterize non-Gaussian effects uh, inside its fiber response, but uh, it might give a more advanced thing than just running this uh, constraint spherical deconvolution. And the requirement is you need uh, multiple um, uh, multiple B values to to this this models. So any of these examples, if you're interested on in testing it, it's the same thing as I explained. So if you go here. And you press the full source code for this example. It will download the Pi script, and you can open it. Like for example, using Spider. Okay, so I showed you yes yesterday. Just put this in my desktop. 
in, in the terminal. And then instead of I, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks, you write Spider. You can use any other uh, um, software to read the uh, Py uh, script. I personally like to use Spider due to the similarities of MATLAB. And, uh, okay, so here was the determinist. So then you just opened the example. So I save it on the desktop. And again, and one thing that I want to point is, again, this recipe is always the same. So you define the model and then you fit it on your data. So it's always, in, defi in defining the model, it's, you always have to give the information of the Git, the, the, your acquisition parameters that are summarized on the GitHub uh, uh, objects. So if you're interested on running one of the examples and the other ones that I will also show you today, you, you can load it like this, or even you can create your own notebook. For example, if you go here, you can create your own your new. And then if, for example, you want to reproduce this example in the notebook, you can glue the text on the cell indicating that it is a text, and then the codes on the shells that you indicate that is a code. And this might, having notebooks sometimes is useful because it saves the, the, the figures that you produce. And for example, if you want to share this with someone, it already has the figures that you uh, produce and sometimes for tutorials, it's very easy to use. But in practice, sometimes you can also run it from here. So sometimes when I'm an analyzing or proofreading codes of, of other, uh, other DiPy developers, I use Spider and I run the examples. Like for example, I just want to run these examples. I copy and paste and then tap enter and it will run that uh, lines of comment. So this is also another way of how to, to read uh, and explore uh, tutorials. So I just, I also want to show more tools that we have in, 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 in DiPy. So let's go again to DiPy. Another thing, and under DiPy, there's also this, this workshop link. So if you're interested to, have, to attend a full week uh, workshop exploring, exploring more tools about it, you can press here and you will be notified when there's the next, uh, the workshop. So here at the moment, we are pointing off last year, which was, in, uh, or this year's 2020, which unfortunately was canceled due to the COVID uh, situation. But this year uh, we are there, uh, we, well, it's not official yet, but we are planning to do it perhaps virtually. So we are discussing it cu currently, and um, and so it might have a, a virtual version uh, this 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 year. So I want to also to show other tools, materials. So else, yeah. So you can also find other models. So for example, the IVIM model to estimate the pseudo perfusion. So it's a model that is very similar to the free water, but instead of trying to estimate the free water, it uses even lower B values try to estimate the pseudo perfusion. And the pseudo perfusion basically is uh, the motion of let's say uh, uh, water in small ca capillary. So it's not a, a diffusion process because it's involved flow, but since it's pseudo random because capillaries can have a, a quite a random oriented system, it will induce a diffusivity that is in high, uh, high order of magnitudes higher than the free water. So this is a strategy that you can estimate to, to have this pseudo perfusion. Okay. So this is an example of another model. I, I think I have a question. So I will just quickly, this is not a question, this is a comment of leaving. Let's continue. So regarding also analysis. So you can also have uh, look to an analysis how to, um, analyze uh, tractography analysis. So for example, there are some tutorials of how to co cognitivity matrices. So here is an example that uses the same data sets on our tutorial. So the, the Stanford uh, data set that had the labels and it uses this labels, label data and diffusion data to reconstruct the cognitive matrix. So if you're interested in how to do this type of analysis, you can also find uh, examples on, on how to 
this, okay? So cognitive in matrix, other things that we have in, in the, that part. So the other thing that I wanted to show you, let me see my notes so I don't forget. Ah, so another analysis that I find quite interesting analysis is the one of having different measurements across tracks. So, so perfect combination of uh, tractography and uh, microstructural uh, uh, metrics. So here in this example, what it's done is, uh, so after that you had done your tractography uh, and you have specific tracts. So in this example, it's, it's loading a, corp uh, um, um, a cortical spin spinal tract. Um, for example, and so what it uh, what it uh, do is to measure the the FA values over that different track. So you can easily adapt this by other. If you, for example, if you save uh, a DKI map uh, or a radial diffusivity map, you can easily uh, adapt it. Uh, to have the metric that you're in interest and have not only measurements of uh, re extracted from uh, regions of interest, but you can uh, analyze the profiles of that, that metric along uh, a track. So this is something that might be interested uh, to, to give um, uh, a look. So regarding also the combination of uh, tractography with modeling, uh, there's also, so in the track, in the track construction, yes, we construct. Okay, so in, under in the, the tutorials of the constraints fair to convolution, there's also the reconstruction with multi shell. So having the multi shell information, one can do the, the same uh, um, uh, SCD uh, reconstruct. Yesterday I showed that you had to estimate. The, the fiber kernel, the kernel to do the deconvolution. So here you can use the multi-shell information to have multiple kernels, okay? So, so here you, can, you have the kernels of white matter, gray matter, and CFA. Where is it? Yeah, here it is, yeah. And then you can, using this, no, this is the segmentation exactly. So you can, so this, in this tutorial, it, it explains how you can use um, the information of a Hardy technique to, to segmentate your uh, CFS uh, white uh, white matter and gray matter, and then it uses to to estimate response functions uh, for each you, and then you use this information uh, to recruit your uh, your tractography. So yeah, here is the 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 example. Yeah, and I think in terms of uh, work on tutorials. I, it's all that I had prepared to, to, to show you. And so the last thing that I wanted to discuss, if there's no questions, let me double check, is some uh, future directions. And I wanted to show some of the, uh, some of a trend that is, is appearing now in cur currently uh, diffusion MRI literature, which is going beyond the, the, um, conventional uh, planner encoding uh, or this two pulse encoding uh, sequences. And this is also, it's something that I'm also uh, now working on DiPy to, to implement. So if you look to the PRs, uh, so if you go, so if you go to the GitHub of DiPy and you're interested to know what is currently being uh, um, uh, develop it, you can look to the pull requests. And here in the pull requests, you have the work on pr progress, okay? And and at the moment I have, yeah, so for example, here you have the single shell free water that I was mentioning. And so what I'm currently developing is this to go into using non-conventional uh, sequences. And I have here some slides. So it's basically the last things that I was pointing last time. And so what is this non-conventional or advanced diffusion MRI uh, sequences? So examples of this is instead of you measuring 
diffusion along a given direction in the D value. You can, for example, measure along two different uh, uh, directions with independent B values and directions and only do your ac acquisition after, okay? So these two blocks will have independent B values and, 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 and directions. Uh, so they can have different, so yeah, it's, it will have a different angle or you can also set to, to parallel or even you can do more uh, exotic uh, experiments as for example, trying to probe all the diffusion directions using this uh, magic angle experiments uh, at the same time. So you're probing diffusion, not on a single direction, but kind of the mean uh, uh, diffusion weighting of them. And why this might be important? Because you can't provide independent information than the conventional sequences. For example, is now growing uh, a, a lot of interest because you can, for example, estimate in the model-free approach, the microFI, which I, I just uh, explained it. And this is having big impact, for example, on the different uh, of tumors. So for example, if you look to the standard FAs, tumors or different types of tumors uh, typically will show low FA uh, values. However, different types of tumors that you, want to, you might need, want to distinguish can have different uh, micro studies. So for, for example, in the case of the meningioma, the, the, struct, the cells are more elongated. However, the FA is low because they are random oriented. In the case of the glioblastoma, you have spherical, more spherical uh, spheres. And again, the FA, though the microstructure environment is completely, the FA is, uh, is low. So if you estimate the, the micro FA, which has explained it's in an intuitive way, it's like aligning all, all your microstructure, right? You will see that the microfay will be able to decouple these two types of, of, of tumor. And why this is uh, uh, a lot of interest in not trying to, to just do more acquisition and going to higher B values or just uh, adding uh, the, few, um, the diffusion times that of this can be done uh, in much faster uh, acquisition times. So for example, there was this recent study that was using this magic angle experiments to measure microfay under three minutes. For, uh, so just to give an intuition how uh, this uh, is able to measure the microscopic uh, anisotropy. So this information is related to the kurtosis. So when we use a conventional acquisition, uh, and for example, we, we, we average all the directions and we have the B-value dependence. We, we see that different systems, so having like isotropic but variant diffusivities or an uh, equal compo components random oriented will uh, have the same non-Gaussian degree. Uh, or for example, if you have this restricted effects between bouncing uh, the waters diffusing and bouncing uh, against uh, uh, barriers. So if you do your standard DKI analysis, you are you will be uh, sensitive to all this. So a sample of all these different sources, and uh, you you don't have any way to distinguish. So if you use now this, for example, this isotropic diffusion encoding in probing all. Uh, all diffusion, you will start being sensitive to the mean diffusivities of the compartments. And why is this important? Important. So, for example, if you have the 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 first system, uh, uh, the mean signals will will be equal to any of the uh, of the diffusion acquired in single direction. So it will give you the exactly the same signal. However, if you apply this on this system that has an isotropy uh, but all compartments are uniform. This sequence will be sensitive to, to only its mean diffusivity. All the systems have the same mean diffusivities. It will show the, the, the linear decay. So you can use uh, this information, uh, use the sequences in combination with the standard uh, signal diffusion encoding uh, to distinguish um, the, the microscopic and its operative degree. So for example, if you ha have assembled of these two types of sources, the difference captured 
by the single diffusion encoding and this multiple diffusion encoding will give you the information of the micro FI. Okay, so this is what is have been uh, it's on uh, current literature, uh, and now it's where my my research my latest research appear. So on this framework, we assume that in each component the diffusivities are Gaussian. However, it completely ignores the effects of diffusion interacting with with uh, with the boundary. So for example, if you have completely confined systems, you will expect that you have a non-Gaussian uh, probability distribution just because you're, con uh, you're truncating the tails of this Gaussian diffusion. So this doesn't take into account this effect. And the way how I, I try to, to, to expand the, the, the kurtosis framework to be able to distinguish this was to, to work on the Comlant expansion of double diffusion encoding signals. So basically the experiment that I was showing in this first. So it's analogous to the DKI framework. So the DKI framework is a Comlant expansion on single diffusion encoding. So if you now you have two pairs of uh, diffusion gradient in directions, now you will be able to decouple not only the diffusion tensor and the kurtosis tensor, but you will also be sensitive to a covariant tensor, okay? And this co covariant tensor is just a, rep uh, a representation of the tensor. However, its geometry it's, was not yet explored. So don't, don't, don't take this slide as this is a real representation of the covariant tensor. But what we know about the covariant tensor is that while the total kurtosis, it's a combination of all the sources of, uh, that I explained, and you are not able to distinguish. The covariance tensor, you can extract the anisotropic part, so the micro FA component has a K anisotropy, uh, has a metric as a kurtosis just sensitive to the microscopic uh, uh, anisotropy effects. And uh, the, uh, the kurtosis of isotropic only depends on the variance of the mean diffusivities of across. So if you have these two sources and you have the total kurtosis, then you can estimate this restricted diffusion uh, 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 component uh, by just subtracting the total with these two uh, different uh, sources. And this was recent. I already test this on, on our, our, uh, our scanners on the center of the sampling for the known. And so this is experiments that was done in ex vivo mouse brains. And just to, to show, so this is the, the total kurtosis that you will get from the, the uh, a DKI exp uh, experiment, but now you're able to distinguish the K, the different sources. So for example, uh, here it's highlight the white matter regions and you see that the K and ISO will have higher values on the white matter. So it's kind of a corrected version of the FA that doesn't depend on fiber artesian dispersion. And then you have the K and ISO that will, uh, it depends on the variance between compartments. And you see that is it highlights the regions near to the ventricles. So this marker can be a, a nice marker to see where, which are the vo voxels that are confounded by partial volume effects of the, of the free water. Or even uh, it, it will be interesting to see this in, uh, in systems that you have edema. So this will highlight the, the, the values with significant edema. And then the k infra estimate, we, we see that we, we measured it for the, for the first time on, this, uh, on this, this brain. And we see that it's not zero. So some, uh, in microstructure models, the common assumption that we can represent a uh, system has uh, uh, a sum of Gaussian uh, or diffusion tensors might not be uh, correct. So yeah, and now recently I'm applying this in different applications, and uh, and I'm I'm seeing that we have here uh, Hazet and Elisa that is, and her project she is applying this for the first time in in, in humans. So there's some preliminary uh, work that we uh, expect to that it will come uh, uh, up uh, uh, soon. So saying this, this is what I prepared for this this work. Uh, if there's any question or comments, 
uh, about uh, this that uh, let me know. I will just quickly see in Slido if someone left any comment. Okay, there's no new comment. So if you if you're interested to ex exploring some of the of the examples of DiPy uh, and you face any problem, you uh, uh, you can indicate. Uh, you can email me if you have any issues or any questions. You can also contact the 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 help that DiPy uh, provides, either from the mailing list, even from the chat, um, and yeah, or even creating an issue on the on DiPy. And yeah, so I think in my side. Uh, this was the work that I prepared for you guys, and I hope that you enjoyed these two days.